morning, all. We're just getting uh, YouTube up and running. Um, welcome to our uh, General Finance Committee meeting of March 16th, 2022 at 9 a.m. I'll call this meeting to order at 9 a.m. Um, I will confirm that uh, all members except for Councillor Hayes are present and she will be attending when she can later this morning. Um, I will, uh, let me see, confirm the CAO clerk and members of the senior management uh, team and staff are present. Uh, I will advise the public input on the agenda was invited to TML public comment at muskokalakes.ca. Um, just for a note, item 4A in our agenda, Kathy McCarthy, Port Carling Lions Club will no longer attend retreat tapping. Just FYI on that for your notes. Um, this public notice, I'll, I'll read, uh, today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka website and YouTube channel. By participating in the open public meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. Uh, we do not have a supplementary agenda today. And I would ask now if there are any committee members uh, with any disclosures of pecuniary interest. Okay, seeing none, thank you for that. I'll, I'll note that the motions today have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite the meeting and that members shall physically raise their hand until the chair has confirmed the vote. Uh, if the vote is unclear, a verbal vote shall be recorded by the clerk. This is not considered a recorded vote. Okay, so we'll move to our agenda. Our first invited delegation at nine o'clock is uh, item 4A, Sean Forth uh, to attend regarding the Muskoka Pride Bench project. Sean, are you, uh, I bring you in now, thank you. Okay, welcome, Sean. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine. Thank you. Are you muted? Are you muted? Can you hear me now? My, my, my voice should be on. How about now? Is my voice working? That's now? good. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, welcome. And you've got an excellent message for us today. So please go ahead. You've got the floor. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, good. Excellent. There you go. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm not really certain what I'm, what I need to present, other than to let you know that Muskoka Pride back in the fall uh, uh, applied for and was approved for a District of Muskoka Community Enhancement Grant with the idea of of placing a rainbow uh, Pride bench in all municipalities in Muskoka and uh, have been working with staff and I think a recommendation is coming forward to putting uh, a bench in one of the parks of Muskoka Lakes. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, and I'm wondering, um, I see item, uh, which of course this is item 8A. I wonder if uh, Corey, you're here with us, Corey Moore. Uh, and of course, Sean, you would have uh, probably interfaced with uh, with Corey over these uh, these past months. I wonder if Corey, because we're essentially um, going to be receiving this with a large thank you, I suppose. <laughs> I wonder if you want to uh, uh, give us a sense as to um, the under underlying notion of this and, uh, and recognition of, et cetera. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, Committee. Um, as Sean had mentioned, um, we had received notification from Muskoka Pride about uh, their donation of a bench to the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Uh, we worked with uh, Sean on possible locations and uh, I think identified uh, Windsor Park in Bala as the preferred spot. Um, the report highlights uh, this and uh, formalizes that decision, as well as provides some alternative options if committee wish, wishes to discuss those. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to committee if there's any questions, maybe. Good, thank you. Um, okay, uh, committee, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, observations on, on this at all? 
There is no actual resolution. Uh, is there? There it is, an order issue. Okay, I didn't do my job this morning. Okay, so we do have a resolution on that, of course. And um, I would read that, but before I do, uh, just a thought committee, and not to get too far into it, but uh, my first thought was uh, as chair, as I read this earlier, um, you know, Hannah Park as well. I mean, clearly there's Bala and there's Port Carling and, and, and we share this fine place. Um, obviously Bala was decided, I believe that because the number is one, there is one bench uh, to be allocated per township as I understand the process. Um, and again, not to get too far into the weeds, one wonders um, how we could establish uh, uh, the notion that we could have a bench, there would be a bench in, in both in Port Carling and Bala. I'm wondering um, the intelligence of that in terms of the, the, the cost of that. Um, perhaps uh, Sean, uh, you know, the, the Muskoka Pride folks could apply to a, for a, a, a community grant that we have that actually closes tomorrow and, um, and, and see what that means in terms of uh, a second bench, one for each of the two, if you will, major centers um, in the township of Muskoka Lakes. I mean, it's, it's just a great news story. Um, so I'm wondering committee if there, well, I guess, first of all, we'd need to understand it, what the cost might be. And again, this cost, what costing wasn't included uh, in this scenario. Um, is that something we wanna look at committee? I'm wondering if you have any appetite or if that was something you might wanna visit at some point in time in the future. Might seem no better time than now, if we're gonna, this is gonna happen. Two versus one. What do you, what do we think? Does anyone uh, have any comments? Any hands up? Any observations or thoughts on that? Okay, I see, seeing none. Um, I'm wondering, Corey, do we have a sense of what the cost might be for this bench in uh, Windsor Park? Uh, through you, Chair, I don't. I may have to rely on Sean uh, for the exact costs and. I think if there's interest from committee and an additional bench, perhaps that's something if Muskoka Pride is interested in, we could definitely look at working on a community grant application with them on. So, but uh, maybe I'll turn it over to Sean. Okay, Sean, Sean, put you on the spot there. <laughs> no, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the costs are somewhere in the range of 14 to 15, 14 to $1,500 per bit for a bench, plus taxes, plus shipping. So, Ballpark two thousand dollars is about the cost of what a bench could be up to. And do we have a sense of it, the install, Corey? From that perspective, I mean, is, is the township uh, going to install this at a cement, et cetera, so at a cost of a thousand dollars? Or uh, that's correct. Yeah, we would. The township would handle the installation, and I, I think the costs are pretty minor and would just be handled through our uh, public works operating budget. Okay, good. Okay, so committee, I, I guess what we're looking at is, uh, and, and of course, if I might, would the $1,500, uh, that would, it could be requested of, of a grant, a community grant that we have in play right now that is uh, coming due. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, if you have an appetite for that, Sean. Uh, perhaps I'll just park that with you for the moment while we ask the mayor to comment and uh, Councillor Edwards. Mayor Hardy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. The um, I guess my simple perspective is right now, Muskoka Pride has asked us to install one bench in our municipality, the same as every other municipality. So we're doing so. Uh, we do raise the flag during Pride Week, uh, which very happy to do so. Um, but my gut feeling right now is to let's install this bench in Bala, and in the future, next year, the year after, if we decide we want to add one, you know, we are one municipality. Muskoka Pride is trying to be inclusive um, and, uh, you know, we don't need Bala and Port Carlin gets one and then Manette gets one. Just, we are Muskoka and it just happens to be in Bala in this particular case. So I'm okay with the resolution right now and let's see what happens over the next 12 months and a couple of years. Thanks. Fair enough. Good. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I agree with uh, the, the mayor on this. Uh, 
you know, I've been pushing for years for uh, and that for uh, memorial benches and everything else like that. People, if they want to remember family members, there's uh, at least two in, in Windermere right now and others. Uh, the families uh, that want them, pay for them. They don't get grants. And I, I think we should be fair to everyone in that. Um, and that, but uh, as, as for now, the motion is just for one bench and I will support that uh, and that definitely, I don't see a problem with that. But if we start having other groups asking for, like the Lions will ask for one, the Lions have, have put, uh, and that bench is in at, at times, other groups, it's, it's a volunteer type thing. So I wouldn't be supporting starting to have organizations take taxpayers money or something like that. Thank you. Good, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, I'm wondering if I could just ask your nodding of heads, if I might, that uh, um, do you subscribe generally to the theories of uh, Councillor Edwards and the mayor? Just uh, just a general feeling and then, and I'm seeing a showing of heads. Okay, good, thank you. Good discussion, excellent discussion and certainly leaving that door open. Um, and again, Sean, thank you uh, for your delegation this morning and thank you for uh, our ballot bench. Um, I'm going to read this resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Jaglowitz. We are recommended that the uh, Council confirm Windsor Park for the location of the Muskoka Pride Community Bench as identified in Staff Report CED 2022-07. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Carried. Thank you. And again, Sean, thank you for all you do and thank you for this gift to the township of Muskoka Lake. We appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Great, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our second delegate, I'm going to uh, defer to my, my peer, uh, uh, Councillor Bridgman. Uh, Councillor Bridgman is going to introduce our second uh, delegate this morning. Barb, you've got the floor, go ahead. Thank you. And here comes Lise now. Uh, thank you, Chair Zavitt says I'm sort of the one uh, who wanted uh, Lise to come. I appreciate being able to introduce her. So Lise is the chair of the West Perry Sound Smart Community Network. And it is, it's evolved from the Regional Economic Development Committee of West Perry Sound to seek a solution for the lack of adequate, affordable internet bandwidth and, and technology. Um, technological uh, capacity for our area. So Lise is working with, I believe it's, there's seven projects on the go now uh, that Lise has on the go with various townships and our neighbors north to us. And they're making great progress on putting broadband into the rural areas that don't have it already. So Lise has been um, extensively involved in Perry Sound and she has lots of experience in the technology um, uh, area. So we asked Lise to, uh, hopefully this will be more of a, a, a question and answer after Lise gives us a general overview of what her group is doing and what's happening north of us and why they're getting on with having internet, because I understand fiber is now in North uh, Lake Joe which I think we'd all love to have. So without further ado, thank you for taking time out, Lisa, and coming and chatting with us. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Um, I'm just gonna give you just a quick background and, I, and a, a bit of an answer, question and answer is, is probably um, a, an interactive process is probably a little bit better. Um, so we started, and this is almost embarrassing, but it's about 10 years ago. And we, um, as part of the um, economic development group uh, for uh, West Perry Sound. And so the spinoff then was um, West Perry Sound Smart, where we basically uh, uh, built or put together a not-for-profit. And the reason we did that was because it gives you flexibility that's outside of the normal um, processes i mean they're still very good processes they're still very ethical and all of that but it doesn't put a, it puts us outside of the municipal a lot of the restrictions around the municipal um, um from uh, the guidelines that you need to follow and uh, so that we could be a little bit more nimble and that's what that was all about um our whole start was based on building a smart community it's based on building um, smart cities um, around the world. I was part of uh, Cisco Systems 
were uh, we were involved in building smart cities, uh, different places uh, worldwide. And live, having moved up to our cottage here, it felt like it's something that should fit a community. And the whole goal was to, you know, take advantage of a digital economy not for everything from healthcare, uh, education, commerce, business, etc. So we put together a number of sessions, uh, community sessions to get um, input from the uh, community stakeholders within the seven um, um, municipalities. And, uh, and then we engaged a, a company to build a, um, a, not a plan for us, but kind of a, a um, not a, a gap analysis, uh, as well as um, opportunity. So um, they put together a report for us. We found that there was um, more, many more gaps than what we had expected, but particularly in the ability to use uh, to, uh, access to internet. And, uh, and that kind of stopped us at that point. And we had to focus on infrastructure, internet infrastructure only, as opposed to everything that we wanted to achieve uh, under a smart community. Um, and so when we started looking at uh, infrastructure only, it became really tough because there isn't the, there wasn't the money for um, smaller communities, uh, rural communities like ours. We worked with uh, Tony Clement on uh, Connected Canadians. We thought we had something going there um, and had asked for 35 million. That didn't work out. That would have built a redundant uh, uh, backbone for us uh, through West Perry Sound. Uh, we didn't get the funding for that because we were uh, well over the cost per household. And unfortunately, like you probably are experiencing that household is uh, considered permanent, not seasonal. So the numbers are quite off uh, when it comes to that. So, but what we did is we started working with, uh, we did a number of RFPs and started getting to know the internet service providers that were interested in our area or could be interested in our area. We needed to generate that demand um, so that they uh, would be good working, uh, so that they would be good to invest in our area, although we knew that an investment by an ISP only would not um, would not help or would, would never come to pass. Um, so uh, we we built re stronger relationships with a couple of them. Um, not everybody's interested. Uh, not you know the large ones were not at all interested, or if they were, they were interested in um, their goals and not necessarily uh, in what we needed. And. Uh, so we got lucky though, after about, we did, I think four large uh, applications. Um, and then we got lucky when we got connected with the um, SendGen group, which is the Center of uh, Excellence for Next Generations uh, Networks. And um, we did a, uh, an expression of interest with them. Uh, the other uh, four uh, doing a backbone doing a project. So let's just say the project where it was going to take place wasn't identified. We just knew that we had the makings of doing a project that fit within their criteria. And um, the uh, uh, municipality of Archipelago uh, a lot, uh, had what's acquired, I guess, a 300 or it's almost 300 foot tower that sits at Tower Hill in uh, Perry Sound. They acquired that from MNR. And that gave us a nice stepping point because most of the uh, ISPs have some kind of presence in uh, Perry Sound, most of the ones that are interested in our area. So we won that uh, expression of interest and uh, so did Vianet. So th the expression of interest were as a, you had to apply as a community and then uh, ISPs had to apply separately um, and they would, and the selection of the ISP that was going to actually do the work for us was selected by Sengen, not ourselves. It just happened to be uh, Vianet, who we worked with and and um, and um, seemed to uh, have a good relationship with. So then we built the backbone. We built a, a fiber or a um, a radio frequency of. Uh, from the tower in, um, at, at, uh, in Perry Sound to Carling Township. 
and it's, it went out to Bayview subdivision and Bayview subdivision has about, it's, it's, it's a subdivision, it's a ver, consider it a rural subdivision. It has about 350 houses within um, the, um, what's the parameter of the um, um, subdivision, uh, but consider it very rural because most lots are, you know, one, two acre lots. So they're quite large. Um, and that what gave us then, so with that backhaul, then we did fiber to the home to everybody that wanted it within that subdivision. And just recently, it's not announced yet, but right, just recently, Svianet submitted a um, proposal to the um, UBF fund, uh, Universal Broadband Fund, uh, under their um, uh, rapid response to uh, build that uh, fiber now out to up to 559. But from the Carling Tower, so we built a tower in Carling, distributed by fiber to the home. Then from that Carling Tower, we built a tower in um, uh, the industrial park. And the funding for that one was joint, fen uh, pardon me, it was joint uh, between Archipelago, <coughs> the industrial park and Vianet. And the reason that Archipelago was involved in that because they that tower had to be a certain height, not for the industrial park, but to go up to Point of Barrel. And then we built another tower up at the Point of Barrel. And the distribution from those towers, depending on um, the viability, financial viability, the ROI to the uh, to the uh, provider, is um, was either by uh, fixed wireless or uh, fiber to the home. Uh, we looked at two projects in Seguin, um, and uh, there's two that uh, that were based on the same premise, uh, but we couldn't get uh, council approval in um, on the tower locations, and so uh, that just didn't seem viable uh, at that anymore. Uh, but we do have two projects in um, Seguin uh, that are uh, being headed up by Kojiko, where they're upgrading their current uh, infrastructure. Uh, and then building fiber to the home. So um, we've got one other project that's going on right now uh, and uh, we're working with MTO uh, to allow um, trenching along the road. And that the Carling project where uh, the first fiber to the home was also trenching along the, the roadside and we got approval from the uh, Carling Township to do that. Um, MTO is a little different uh, but uh, through um, working with our uh, MPP, Norm Miller, uh, we have a uh, access to um, the right people who can make the decisions for us. And we've got another project that is, is pending uh, as long as we can get that approval to trench along the road. ISPs tend to like to trench along the road best. Uh, poles are very difficult for them because it's expensive and the, the uh, rules and constraints around that are, are significant. So that's where we are. Um, and uh, in, in most cases, there's a, a funding that from a local basis, but also from the ISP. And in all cases, except uh, the original tower in uh, Perry Sound, the tower is owned, uh, remains the uh, property and ownership of the uh, ISP. Does that kind of summarize it? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, well, again, thank you for uh, your information. Uh, such a weighty topic. Um, so I, I guess as, as Barb Bridgman has, has sort of been our, I, I call her our advocate, self-appointed somewhat, uh, but certainly <laughs> she's uh, been just an absolute zealot on this, this issue. And I certainly support her 100%. I certainly support Corey Moore, who sits with uh, on our behalf on, at the district on their self-appointed, uh, on their group. Um, and uh, yeah, so all of that having been said, if you just hang on here, I'm gonna let the mayor speak and then of course, Councillor Bridgman. And uh, let's see where we can go with this. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thanks, Lise, for joining us today. Um, just a question, sort of in your experience is what's been turned on. You talked about <clears throat> Western Perry Sound, a small rural community of about 350 homes. Um, in one of your examples that got turned on, so to speak. 
What's the small side? Um, and, and are we turning on wirelessly or are we turning on hardwired? Uh, you talked about trenching. Um, you know, I, I always find the difficulty for any ISP to provide service to go down a road and turn on three homes. Oh, yeah. Uh, when they've done about a kilometer of uh, trenching. Uh, we do know, and I'm sure you're aware, that uh, the province has uh, sort of deregulated poles and allowed for a, a less expensive cost of hanging fiber off of poles, but it still provides, you know, when I've got to do a kilometer worth of uh, trenching or pole hanging to get to those three homes, it's difficult. So uh, understanding our topography um, and our uh, sort of locations of our properties, uh, where do you see us going? Is it wireless? Is it wired? I mean, are there wireless examples that are moving forward? Yeah, we have both. We have both. And it's for the reasons that you described. So uh, the reason that the Bayview subdivision was selected is because it was, there was critical mass that enabled the, the, the cost of the um, doing the trenching. So that's all wired. I mean, that's all fiber right to the home. You know, we've got the little orange posts at the end of the driveway and everybody seems happy. There is, but from there, we there are people that work within that uh, area that can get it uh, from uh, what I call fixed wireless. And, and fixed wireless is different than cellular fire uh, wireless um, in that it's engineered for a specific number of people and people just can't hop on like you do in a cellular um, uh, situation. So uh, the, the industrial park is uh, fixed wireless and they're very happy with what they're getting. Um, and the uh, point of barrel will be uh, fixed wireless. There's fixed wireless off the Carling Tower as well. Uh, so it is a combination. I know that the um, province has tried to and has improved certainly things around the poles, but ISPs are still finding um, that Bell and Hydro are still hard to work with. It's still taking time to get the permitting done. It's still expensive. It's still, it's not, it, you know, we've had uh, as a background, we had, uh, and I'm gonna smash Bell on this. I really am because they deserve, uh, they don't deserve anything but criticism in how they've treated rural communities. And so we had a project three, four years ago uh, where Bell had a central office uh, location close to the industrial park. And all it would have needed to upgrade that central office to serve the industrial park was about $30,000 worth of infrastructure upgrade. They refused to do it because they, you know, had plans down the road and they didn't want anybody to interrupt or, you know, um, uh, take or uh, they didn't want any competition down the road. So, you know, I, I think our areas have been very hurt by uh, having the large player uh, like Bell have a monopoly on us. And, um, and so when you get back to poles, it is Bell and it is Hydro. Hydro is just Hydro, right? So until, and, and the argument that I have with the government when we, when we do speak about it is that it was in terms of hydro, it was a public asset. It's like public monies that paid for that. So it sh there shouldn't be a cost um, to hang a cable along those poles. Anyway, that's my little soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> hydro and bell. <laughs> It's not your first rodeo. Thank no. <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Councillor Bridgman, you go ahead. And then Councillor, uh, let me see, who else is there? Roberts. Oh, Councillor Roberts. I'll sorry. fill sorry. it in for you. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I mean, it is my understanding, Lise, that the big players really just want to be on the lakefront where their business model works really well. So it's not about servicing the the rural areas, and I get that. But I think just conceptually, what I've come to understand is you have to build that backbone throughout our area, and then you run that last mile with whatever it is. It's not going to be fiber a lot of the time or, or whatever. But in terms of the towers, I think this is important because you did say that council wouldn't support towers on the lake. And could you help us understand the difference in the efficiency of a of a tall tower to the monopine 
towers and cost wise. And I know we talked about with Councillor Mazan and you and I and Mayor McDermott that you put those large towers, maybe not on the water, but they're, they're a real part of what we need. So would you mind expanding on that and then explain also what microwave link means in terms of all of that? Okay, so um, the towers actually in Seguin weren't, uh, well, in one case it was on the lakefront, but it was beside a whole number of other towers, including the Henby Inlet. So it wasn't like we were adding uh, something uh, serious to that. It was just politics. Let's just call that politics. It wasn't so much the tower. Um, monopines, uh, they're, they're, they're too short, right? So you can only get so high on a, on a tower with the equipment. So, and, and any equipment that has enough, um, um, enough capacity to serve a, an area around it, that equipment is heavy and you've got sway considerations, you've got structural considerations to consider on that tower. So um, there's a, a, what, it's not as simple as just picking a low tower or a high tower. The other thing is it's, it's not, you can't just assume that if you build a high tower uh, that there's a number of people that can go off that to serve it because there's, you know, um, other cons there's other constraints on that besides the structural capacity of the tower, there's also interference. And then there's also who owns it. So let me tell you that, um, and you can't, and, and I don't, one of the things that we need to be careful of, what happened to us is that we had a small ISP, uh, we, uh, WISP, that was serving the Healy Lake area. And he was providing them not, you know, not um, service at 50 by 10, but more like, you know, five and five by one, but at least it was service. And so what happened was he was getting his bandwidth from Bell. And Bell then, and then he needed, he wanted more bandwidth because he wanted to provide a higher level of, uh, of service. And Bell cut him off, cut him off said, we're not serving you anymore. We're not selling you anything effective, you know, all, with very little notice. So we, the, our group then um, connected him to uh, the provider that we have coming off this smart tower. We call it a smart tower. At least we got our name in there. <laughs> and uh, so it was, uh, so we connected him with them uh, and he could then continue providing the service. So you have to be careful. There, the there isn't the there isn't the propensity to work together that you would hope there is and so you need to make sure that that's very that's contracted or that there is a real desire uh to do that up front because this guy was totally he would have been out of business now fortunately he was uh that wasn't his only um uh, form of um, uh, employment, but it, he would have been out of business. So towers are complex in that you need to understand the complexity of them. You got to understand their reach. You need to understand uh, who owns them and what um, what type of uh, considerations and uh, might come into play in the future. Um, and so and that answers, I hope that answers that question. This, if not, let me know. The other part is uh, you were asking about, um, I've just lost it now. Um, There's a microwave length. What, microwave. What, does that, what does that mean? It's just, it's a radio frequency. And don't ask me to go any further because I have a couple of people on my team that are, uh, that I depend on because they're technical. And, you know, I, uh, I've been on the business side of this for uh, even in, you know, when I worked for Cisco, uh, I was not uh, definitely a uh, expert in technology. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair, and, and through you, <clears throat> congratulations on how you've nudged this battleship forward for the Fairy <laughs> Sound area. Um, I understand dealing with these big monopolies, and they still are monopolies, even though Bell says they're not. Um, <laughs> you, you've, made, you've made strides, and we'd like to just get a little small piece of that and maybe help us at our township office. But anyways, we'll that, put that aside. I have a, a couple of questions, and it, 
you know, the Ontario government has been boasting, and uh, now with an election year coming up, they're going to be boasting more. It doesn't matter whether you're Liberal, Conservative, or NDP, or whatever, <laughs> that uh, fiber is important to all residents in Ontario, that it's important to have them. But it's clear to us that the government, um, the governments and uh, the bureaucrats, they quite don't understand um, rural broadband and the hoops and rock that we have to go through in order to put fiber out there. And what what can this small little township do is to um, uh, educate the government? And who do we go to? I think you said earlier about you got the right people to the right people. How do we get to the right people to educate them that we're not uh, we, we're, we're not in dirt, we're in rock. And right. we, need, we need funding to support, to support that. And I have a follow-up question. Thank you. Okay, well, that's a tough one, and all, and and one of uh, it, when I said we were on this for about ten years, it's we had more, uh, we've done more advocacy than you know. We, we, it just takes just participating in any um, conferences. It's just getting to to uh, know people through the contacts and just talking it up. But I think. You're right, the decision makers are in um, the urban communities. They do not understand rural. Um, and it's just really, really tough. So what we what we do is our ISPs advocate, we advocate. Uh, we just, uh, I, I think the latest, um, the AHAISP or something, Advanced um, Internet Program by the government shows just, it, just how poor their understanding is. Uh, so we've written, um, we've, we've talked to them, we've documented it in, uh, in uh, writing um, what the problems are with that. Um, they've just created, they've just, it's, it's a monopoly that they've created. They're just helping the monopoly around because the only people who can afford that reverse auction is Bell, Rogers, TELUS, but TELUS isn't big here. Um, that they're the only ones that can re, that can raise the capital or have the capital to meet the requirements of that project or of that um, uh, requirements of that program. So there's no easy way. I mean, if you have contacts in uh, cottagers are good form of contacts because they still a lot of them are still working in you know uh, the city. Uh, many of them have some very high level positions and contacts within the government. Um, sometimes it's good to get them. I mean, I have my neighbor here is a, he just moved in this last year, but he's a C, he's a, C, a VP with Rogers. So, you know, uh, it's, and he, and this is kind of funny because he goes back to work and he says he gets better service here than in the city, but it's because of the, 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 the uh, fiber. I'm kind of talking around it and I don't mean to kind of rattle on about this. There's no easy way. It's just, you have to continue, you know, it's through contacts and, um, and continue to try to make the point and try to get to the right people. Okay. Just have a follow-up uh, Mr. Chair on, on two things, just on one point that um, um, our presenter was making is that, um, you know, contact ISPs and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm aware that uh, some uh, townships and municipalities <laughs> Have actually uh, engaged um, uh, technology firms and to to partner with them. I think you did a little bit of that. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Is like should the township or the district actually be engaging a, a real good uh, technology firm to help guide us through and and to lobby? Uh, what do you mean by technology firm? You mean an uh, ISP or you mean a an ISP or a, a really an, an, like we talk a good story. Well, we know nothing about fiber. We know nothing about what doors to knock on, who to talk to. So you, you need to partner with subject matter experts. Um, I think uh, Southwestern Integrated Fiber Technology is working with Caledon, but um, that's the type of thing I'm thinking. Yeah, SWIFT. So you're talking about SWIFT. So they, we actually try, we're probably a closer model to SWIFT and uh, EORN, which is the Eastern Ontario um, then we are some other, uh, what, what, what people might think, but we're too small. So we have very little influence, right? So, but, but the goal, what they do, and, and they got some money, SWIFT got 200, um, 
million, uh, even four or five years ago, uh, but they had they were very slow in getting it out there and using it. Eorn got eighty thousand dollars, and they worked through John Baird, and they when they first got their uh, projects running, but their projects were not fiber. Their projects it was almost it was a shame because the technology was a bit of a throwaway, and they had to go back and get some more money um, to upgrade it. But uh, if we would have started, if we could have formed a large group uh, 10 years ago, that would be the way to do it because it has influence and, uh, and clout. Um, but it takes, it took both of those organizations probably three and four or five years to get established so that they could do something. So the best way we found was, as you say, um, collaborate with an ISP. Get somebody that is interested in your area, that is large enough. We found working with the, um, and what we've been prom promoting with the government is working with mid-size uh, mid, mid ISP. You go too small, they don't have the capacity to do anything. Here's the problem right now is that the government has let out so much money in the past two years uh, through these grants that they, um, that they, uh, um, that the capacity is not there for the ISPs mm -hmm. to take on anymore, okay? So that's one problem. Second problem is there is still a, a supply, and I know everybody blames this, but there is a supply chain chain issue. Um, the, the, the manufacture of fiber, most of it is done, I think, in, in Texas, and it's they'll, they're well behind. So you've got, you've got problems there. And, you know, third is now getting, when does the next application, when's the next uh, release of funds uh, through uh, these programs uh, take place? Because right now, um, the last uh, UBF and uh, ICANN funds are going to uh, consume most of these ISPs for the next two to three years. Year. So yeah. it's not, but, but it's the time to build. I mean, and that's, it's patience. I mean, uh, there's no other way to look at it. I'm not a very patient person, but there was no choice. <laughs> it's just, it's patience. It's building those relationships now and finding somebody who is interested in your area. Okay. okay. Then my final question is on this is that, uh, we know that the Ontario government has given a lot of money for for fiber, and you said in your in your in your presentation the first part that um, they don't count they only count households and we know that Township Muskoka Lakes doesn't have a lot of households, um, but we have a pile of seasonals. So how successful are we going to be at Township of Muskoka Lakes specifically in getting any part of that big that big pot of money? that the government has put up? You might have to start small. I mean, there's the, 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 challenge that, the challenge that I see, I mean, you have to make that decision yourself, but the challenge I see, you either um, go large and go for a large project and um, do uh, uh, private uh, PPP funding or whatever. Um, and that's what we thought we were gonna do with our first projects is PPP, but we were far, far too small for that. Like even 35 million would not, uh, justify the amount of work that would have to be done for a PPP application. Um, so it's either go in large or then do what we ended up having to do is just one small project at a time. So one of the things I would recommend, and I can send you the link, I could send you the contact and I'll speak with him in advance, is contact um, uh, Kirby, our contact at SendGen, um, because he always has projects that are going. And it, it's amazing how, how starting small and then you build off that. Yeah, okay. And you're, and you're not asking for a huge amount of money. You might want to have to put some in a little bit in yourself. We didn't for SendGen for the first project. So we were fortunate. Uh, Carling was fortunate, uh, the township of Carling. Um, that's, I mean, the only way I see it, everybody wants to go big, but the only way we were successful is to just kind of plug away small projects, small project, one after the other, and hit the areas that, uh, you know, uh, are going to need to be hit. And, you know, Carling itself has 80, 75 to 80% of our residents in Carling are seasonal. So the situation's not that different. Okay, good. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Yeah, Councillor uh, Nishka, or sorry, <laughs> Councillor Jagwitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, through you to uh, Lise. Uh, Lise, very impressive. Thanks very much for coming today. Um, my interest is in, in how you're structured. Uh, you're called the West Perry Sound Smart Community Network. And I know Perry Sound, unlike this district, has a, a number of single tier municipalities. Could you just kind of define which municipalities are in this West uh, Perry Sound group? So uh, just to get a sense of whether it's the whole district, uh, including Perry Sound, or it's a little subset or how, how you're structured. So West Perry Sound consists of seven municipalities. So uh, Whitestone, uh, McKellar, McDougall, Carling, Seguin, the town of Perry Sound and Archipelago. Those are the seven. So when we formed, we formed as being, and uh, being part of the, uh, I, I joined, I guess what it was is uh, the um, REDAC, which was the Regional Economic Development Association or uh, was, served those and represented and made were made up was made up by those seven municipalities so that's how it started um i can't say that so then when we decided that we would it was best if we had a not-for-profit so, uh, organization to do this um how do i say this nicely um <sighs> Municipalities are municipalities, okay? <laughs> Sometimes it's not that easy to work with municipalities. Um, and so, you know, we needed to be able to be more nimble and, and, and get something done for the municipalities on behalf of the municipalities, but not under the uh, restrictions of the municipalities. But the municipalities funded, our, um, funded us uh, in terms of becoming a not-for-profit, they funded that. Um, not all municipalities participate with us. I mean, we, we do deputations and we uh, um, try to serve them. And, I mean, and, 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 but not all of them um, find that not, it's not a priority for all of them in terms of uh, what we do. So we tend to work uh, for the residents uh, collaborating with the municipalities. Um, and our funding is very limited and we don't need a lot of money because it's our team, our, our, uh, we're volunteers. So we're not, we, we basically have volunteered our time uh, over these years uh, to actually drive forward uh, high-speed internet into our area. So it's that level of commitment. So we get... Uh, if we get maybe an archipelago has probably been the most um, generous in terms of providing us the use of that tower. Uh, and then one of the other projects, they invested quite highly in it, but it, um, uh, it was an aside project that, um, that they felt was, was a good project and, and we just didn't drive forward with it in the end. Uh, so they were quite, but, but the rest of it is like, you know, a couple thousand a year from Seguin or a couple thousand a year from Archipelago. So that's what we live by. And it pays our, as long as it pays for our insurance as an organization, and as long as it pays for uh, any um, participation in, in conferences and things like that, a bit of travel associated with that. So we're quite a, um, we're quite a nimble group, I'll call it. So, so quick supplementary, and then I wonder if I might, Frank, Councillor, Councillor Jaguars. I wonder because we're we're time is dragging on here, moving along. I'm going to give the mayor the last word, but before I do, I'm going to uh, ask Councillor Mazan uh, for her comment, and then um, Councillor Edwards, and then we'll give the mayor the last word, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and through you, and I, I'm going to pick, try and pick up where Frank was just leaving off. I, I think. Um, I'm trying to think as a municipality, we did have a chance to meet Lise. It's lovely to see you again, thank you. I'm now trying to be uh, quick with my time. Um, from a municipality standpoint, I've written down the three areas I think that we can we can be doing something to try to support this. I'm sure there's more, but uh, just as you we were talking today. The first, it sounds like there are some municipalities who are putting some skin and money into the um, this initiative for a variety of different models and ways. So what I just learned here is that in fact, the six um, 
municipality or some municipalities are actually supporting you, your organization. Um, so that's one way. I, I understand also that Segwin actually has a, um, I think it's $50. Is that right? I can't remember what Ann had said. Oh, a levy. Yes, they have a, a levy. They, yeah. And, and in, the, in the discussion with her, they do have some monies now set aside. And is it, so I'm going to ask this question. It sounds to me like there is an opportunity for us to explore different ways as a municipality to perhaps have some kind of a commitment financially. What that looks like today, I'm not going to get into any of those details. Is that something that you think is important? Um, well, it, yes, I guess it is because it, it, it basically uh, it, 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 it ensures that there's a commitment to it, right? Okay, okay so that's great, thank you. Um, the second part that I, I think I picked up more today than I did in our original conversation was the importance of advocacy. Um, and I think I, I left our, our last conversation saying if anybody can do it, the Township of Muskoka Lakes can simply because we have such a, a significant seasonal population and you've touched upon that a few times today. So uh, I just want confirmation that advocacy continues and is, is a big part of the strategy. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And the third thing is, uh, super quick, sorry, uh, Chair, um, the trenching piece. Uh, when I left last time, I, I, I heard from Segwin, you know, it's just an easy policy that they've put in place so that any time a new road goes in, they just put in the um, conduit. And is that something that, like, I think I heard this today. It is something that you would recommend. It uh, is. So, sorry, go sorry. Ahead. Didn't no, go ahead. no, no, that's okay. It, it is, and, and it, it's possible on new roads, uh, not necessarily when you upgrade roads, but uh, on new roads and on roads that are owned by the municipalities. And the, But then again, you need to look at, you know, if it's a road that's got two people on it for two kilometers, right. does that make sense? It probably doesn't make sense. You know, I just want to just interject quickly. The, to the, the, the Ontario province says fiber to the home for all. That is... That's not realistic. It's uh, it's a pipe dream. Uh, so you've got to look at a combination of uh, technologies. So don't forget there is also Starlink, and you know that's that will serve some places, some homes that that will better than trying to do uh, fixed wireless trying to get through trees and rocks, you know, so there's a number of technologies you need to look at. I mean, that's the other thing I want to leave with you is that it's not just one technology. All right. Well, very good. Okay. Uh, Councillor Edwards, and then Frank, I will let you have a comment, of course, and, and then the mayor's final word. Thank you very much. Just two, two quick ones. You know, everybody wants um, high-speed internet. But, you know, people don't want to be 100 foot towers, which makes it hard because we, we get that, and that pushback. And I don't know what the answer is on that. Uh, but um, if towers are the answer, should we be just saying, no, we, we put 300 foot towers in, we don't need as many? Is it cost savings? I don't know. I don't know the answer. And the second thing, uh, which probably more to our uh, council, is um, high speed internet. There's a new bell tower in Raymond. I've been asked by, uh, by two or three people now, why doesn't Raymond Hall have it? And I, I was talking to uh, Director Becking and he said, I believe they we're working with the core broadband, but why can't Bell put uh, high-speed internet in the uh, in the community centers and that uh, people could uh, at least go there to use it if, if they don't have it in in their areas. And that, but we should prevent that because people basically right beside the hall have high-speed now. Thank you. Good, thank you. Duly noted. Okay, uh, Councillor Jagwitz, I'll let you have that final uh, word. Uh, yeah, it was should... a very brief follow-up question, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Elise, um, I understand you're a non-for-profit non group. Would, would you consider Township Muskoka Lakes joining your group? Since we're <laughs> very close, very closely attached to you and uh, as, a, as a solution. I, you know, I... I... There should be a quick answer to that, but I don't because I really need to. We are still a not-for-profit. We have we have our um, our uh, uh, policies and bylaws. Um, I just I need to talk to the team about that and do a bit of research on it. Great, thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, Mayor Mayor Harding, I'm going to give you the final word, sir. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate this discussion. I think as uh, 
they said, you know, you've been at this for 10 years. Uh, for those who've been around this council table, we've talked about broadband for uh, equally as long. Um, I can tell council, I've personally uh, been working on this with our largest provider, Rogers, uh, who have a vested interest. And in. as what you suggested is that who you know sometimes gets uh, things moving forward. Um, we're very fortunate, Everett Rogers, uh, German CEO of Rogers is a uh, seasonal resident up here as a friend of mine, I spoke with him uh, as much as a week ago now on the same topic, uh, as well as some of his senior VPs. I think I said this a couple months ago, Rogers has 50 projects that they're applying for across mm -hmm. the country, um, but Muskoka Lakes in particular is on their top five. And um, it is uh, probably not, as Liz said, uh, going to be a fiber. It's going to be a mixed combination, some fixed wireless components to it. Um, but they are waiting for funding. So I think my encouragement, uh, and to hopefully land this airplane, let us move on, um, is that uh, all of council, when we know senior execs at Bell or TELUS or whomever it is, or any of the ISP providers, just to continue that discussion, that lobbying, to say, what can we do? To support. I don't think putting away uh, $100,000 or $200,000 in a fund right now, uh, if the opportunity presented ourselves, I think we would be able to support it. I know that uh, Councillor Shikawa and Councillor Edwards would be well aware that uh, the district about six or seven years ago was approached uh, and was going to loan some funds to a ISP provider should they win the bid. So as long as we're open to that, and I think that's the uh, message to the ISP providers, we're not in the ISP business. Uh, but we can certainly support them in their efforts to get more money. But it is an expensive business to move this forward. So um, I, I encourage all of council to whomever you know, just to have a conversation and see what it is we can continue to do to support their initiative in lobbying the province and the federal government. I think let's, at least that might be a good suggestion for all of us that we can enable 10 people to move forward that way. Good. Thank you very much. And I'm going to let uh, Councillor Bridgman thank Lise and uh, make a comment. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Zavitz, and thank you, Lise, for coming and spending the time with us. And the my my um, wish this morning was really just educational. And as I'd said before, let's see what the district plan is, because as Lise is aware, the district right now has a report on their table uh, as to how to move forward. So I just think we're better equipped as a township once that plan gets in place, or if it drags on too long, to see if we want to do our own broadband uh, initiative if if the district is not interested in in a plan that's really going to help all of our constituents here in, in the township. So thank you again, Lise, and thank you everybody for taking the time. I know it was long, but the more knowledge we have, the better decisions we're going to make going forward. Thank you very much, thank Chair. You. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Lise. Thank you. Um, Take care. Good thank luck. Thank, thank you. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Okay, it's uh, essentially 10 o'clock. How would you like to take a uh, five minute uh, break? Let's come back at 10.05 and uh, we'll get going with item 5A, which is a report from Director Becking on the Skeleton Lake water access property, mainland parking and docking. Thank you.
Okay, committee, good morning. Good morning to the public uh, watching. It's 10 after, or five after 10. And uh, we're gonna get going again. Hopefully we'll have everyone in their seats momentarily. Good stuff. Okay, so item 5A, uh, we're gonna call on our director of public works, Ken Becking. Ken, come on on and uh, talk to us about uh, Skeleton Lake. Uh, the water access property, mainland parking and docking. I read your report. Uh, thank thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members of committee. Um, the report sets out the uh, the background. Um, staff have met with the uh, with the uh, proponents, uh, consistent with your direction. Uh, essentially, this boils down to uh, some private sector changes that have resulted in. Uh, access, uh, potential access limitations for the group. Um, you know, they, they're, they've focused their, their ask um, uh, from the township uh, to include uh, provision of land, uh, land side or mainland parking uh, for their exclusive use, uh, signage to that effect and, and provision of additional uh, dockage space. Um, at the end of the day, uh, this is a, is not a unique situation as you're aware. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's indicative of a problem that exists on other, uh, lakes within the township and, um, and frankly, a series of one-off solutions is not going to address the issue in, in my opinion, um, I would suggest to you that a longer term uh, um, policy based approach is probably the most appropriate way to deal with this matter. Um, and, and to that end, uh, in previous uh, situations, you've, you've indicated the, a desire to have this addressed through the transportation master plan. I believe that that's the most appropriate course of action. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the report lays out a series of alternatives that you may wish to consider. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, be happy to answer questions. Good, thank you. Okay, committee, um, very insightful report, very inclusive and uh, certainly covered a lot of ground, gave uh, options to this committee. Um, but as we are hearing, um, our director of uh, public works is recommending um, the transportation master plan inclusion uh, for this particular aspect, as there are others around our lakes. And so clearly this is a larger, uh, a larger issue, a larger question. And um, having said that, I'll uh, look to committee for a show of hands. Uh, anybody have any comments, thoughts? There we go. So Councillor Roberts, you go ahead. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and um, through you, um, I'm fully supportive of um, as we have done with the other um, parking issues that are concerns that we have that we, we rely on the transportation plan to come up with some sort of policy. I just ask that um, I know at your meeting, uh, Director um, uh, Becking, is that there was a proposal maybe to some of the parking um, uh, could be accommodated through the one um, uh, property that is about a kilometer from um, the one dock. Um, would there be a big cost in doing that, do you think, or um, would it, would it, or sufficient effort uh, to implement that this year? Just a question there. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think um, that's probably the most practical solution. Um, uh, frankly, a, a day or two with a, with a, a D4, a dozer, uh, would probably... Uh, take care of the bulk of the issue, I wouldn't see it as being a horrendous expenditure. Um, so I, I, I would propose if it's not a huge expenditure, and then the other one, do we have, do you have uh, um, funds within your, your budget or do we have to ask for other funds to do that? Just to set up that parking lot spot, not, not unlike what we've done in Bomars, when we, when we have the community center and we tell them, we tell our, our constituents in that area to park there and arrange their own transportation. So again, my question is, would there be a large expense to that? Uh, or is it within your budget? I, I think we can probably um, adjust 
uh, our program to to accommodate it um, because it is a a uh, a pit. Uh, there is a um, there is a source of revenue from aggregate uh, resources uh, that could be drawn upon if if needed. But I I frankly sincerely doubt that that would be necessary. Okay, I would hope that um, we could modify the M Mr. Chair the the um, or we get a nodding of the heads of of my fellow um, peers here whether that would be an acceptable action short term action for this year. Okay, Thank let's you. Uh, let's take that straw poll. Well, Councillor Nishikawa has her hand up, and then Councillor Edwards. I'm seeing uh, a show of support for that, uh, but let's let's hear from the other two councillors first, and then I'll ask you uh, that again. Thank you. So, Councilor Nishikawa, go ahead. Thank you. I, I think um, my biggest concern at this point is that, yes, it goes to the, to the master plan, but um, I, I would not be in favor of using a, um, a municipal site and having uh, designated parking locations. It, it should be open to the public like all our, our other facilities so that there's not somebody running over saying so-and-so was parking in, you know, that's not the business that we're in um, and it should be open to all of the public. Okay, good. So, but, but I would imagine based on what you've just said, you would be in favor of uh, what Councillor Roberts had suggested that we would create an area of general parking uh, within a kilometer. Um, yes, but I'm um, not, but, as well as Director Becking, you and I had a very short conversation about a dog park. Maybe we could look at the both of them. I'm just saying. There you go. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, Councillor uh, Edwards, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Annette. For you, uh, this is a short term band aid, Annette. And what we have to do is make sure our marinas stay open. And that uh, we should never allow them to to down zone, and that, and um, uh, I think we'll find out at this afternoon's meeting uh, just how it, uh, important this is. I could go with the uh, with this this temporary patch, but we have to come up with a solution, and it shouldn't be uh, the township solution. When people get a severance, they they have to have private parking. The marinas are the uh, parking for it. And that's so that, uh, you know, and I'm sure that uh, with the charges and that the Marines can make a, a, a decent living on this. So it's really not our uh, problem. And hopefully we can uh, resolve it this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mazan, go ahead. Uh, quick, uh, thank you. And through you, just a, a question for Director Becking. Um, I know we had to go through this at one of our other public docks because the, the boat cleats, um, they were old, some of the, boat, the, the docks were rotting. And I noted that you had a comment that there was an opportunity possibly to maybe reconfigure some of the boat cleats. This is actually very practical um, when you have different boats coming and going uh, to a lot of our different docks. If the cleats aren't actually set up in, an, uh, in a certain way, it actually is difficult to actually land your boat safely to get in and out. So to me, that seemed like a practical and fairly small ask if there's just a way to make sure our, our government dog has the appropriate fleets. Ken? Thank you. Certainly, Mr. Chairman, we can we can do that. I I would agree. It's a it's a fairly simple, uh, easy fix. Um, I I I don't necessarily agree with the with the proponents' numbers, but we can certainly adjust them to be more efficient, make more efficient use of the available space. Okay, good. So what I've just heard uh, as commitments from our director of public works is that he's willing to um, look at the dock scenario and I, I guess um, manage that or massage that as we've heard, as well as the parking, um, the interim parking scenario, uh, clearing of some property that we would own within a kilometer and and make that available. Um, Ken, are you comfortable with both of those commitments that you've uh, you're indicating here? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So we then, can take um, care of it. Okay, good. Thank you. So I, I think in this case, um, 
you know, it's now on the public record as a matter of course for this meeting. Um, I do have a resolution that simply refers to uh, this issue uh, going to the transportation master plan. We've heard the commitment from our director of public works. Um, I would read this uh, without adding it to adding his commitment to this resolution if, uh, if committee is so inclined. Um, I'm just looking for a bit of a showing uh, nodding of heads there and I'm seeing most thumbs up, et cetera, good. So, okay, given that committee, I'm gonna read this resolution and thank you, Ken, for being so malleable there. Moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Roberts, be it resolved that the mass, sorry, the matter of additional access to Skeleton Lake be considered through the transportation master plan study scheduled to start in the third quarter of 2022. All those in favor? Good, that is carried unanimously. Thank you, committee. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Ken, Director Becking, item uh, 5B is your report uh, regarding the asset management plan sections three and four. Go right ahead, sir. You have the floor. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, consistent with the the plan, work plan that you approved back in, in January. Uh, the next installments of the, uh, on the asset management plan are before you. Um, I don't think it's necessary to, to uh, discuss it at this point, Mr. Chairman, but uh, rather that, that you simply receive the, uh, the two sections. And um, if any members of committee uh, have any questions or, or wish uh, to make comment, uh, certainly they can reach out to me directly and I'll, uh, I'll take that information under advisement and we'll incorporate it into the, uh, the, the final draft that will come back to you in, in May. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, committee, in fact, uh, part two of our resolution this morning uh, does include uh, the, the uh, director's comments, which are uh, asking for you to forward any comments or question and or questions to him for explanation, uh, further consideration and inclusion in the May report. So um, I'm looking at committee, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, committee, any thoughts, any concerns, any statements you'd like to make on this uh, very insightful report? which I thank you for, Ken. Okay, I'm gonna read this resolution then moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa, be it resolved that the General and Finance Committee received the drafts of sections three and four of the asset management plan and that committee members forward any comments and questions to the director for explanation or further consideration. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, committee. Okay, Ken, uh, Director of Public Works is going to speak to us on the uh, 2021 OSIM report. Uh, Ken, you've got the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm bringing forward this report because of um, committee's um, interest in, in um, when you'll recall when we discussed the roads, having a, an understanding of where things are at with, with the various roads. Well, I'm simply bringing forward this report to give you a status report of where things are at with our various bridges. Um, it uh, will come as no surprise to you that um, Battle Falls Bridge uh, rises to the top in terms of, of needs, followed by the Dark Bay Road culvert. Uh, those will require replacement in the short term. Uh, we're already planning to deal with the Bella Falls Bridge uh, later this year. Um, within the next six to 10 years, um, there are five further structures that will need uh, council's attention. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, or a small number of, of um, urgent maintenance items um, the majority of which have already been addressed. We, we dealt with them last year. Uh, there are a few that I will endeavor to uh, deal with this year. Um, in addition, uh, the um, consultant is recommending some additional investigative work, totaling some $65,000. I can tell you right now, I will not be able to absorb that within the current year's oh, yeah. Uh, program in its entirety. 
Um, I will endeavor to deal with a couple of probably one or perhaps two of the more critical items. Um, and then I will bring forward um, a additional request in uh, 2023 to deal with uh, the less important matters. Um, and at the same time, when we come forward to council in 2023 with the budget, uh, we'll adjust the uh, 10 year capital forecast uh, to reflect the uh, findings of the of the report. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good. That seems like a really viable solution. It was my going to be my question. So you've taken my question away. Uh, committee thoughts on that thoughts on this report. Uh, I might. I wonder if I might uh, ask, um, and again, as it's on the topic of bridges and very specifically the Battle of Falls Bridge uh, and its proposed uh, commencement of construction this summer, um, and Ken, under separate cover, might we, uh, you, you will be sharing a, an approach to, to the handling of the traffic on Battle of Falls Road as it relates to the, essentially the closing of the bridge access so that there's you know, one way in and one, one way out, ingress, egress to Battle of Falls Road off of 169. Um, is that under separate cover? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, the design is, is uh, becoming well advanced. Uh, we, were, we will be approaching uh, very shortly 90% uh, completion in terms of the design. Um, given the nature of the work, it will be necessary to close the bridge during construction, um, and we will uh, have the contractor erect appro appropriate signage to uh, advise the uh, the public of um, of uh, how to deal with the the closure uh, during the construction. So uh, that will uh, will uh, be taken care of. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mayor Harding. Thank you. Just to clarify, so the sixty-five thousand uh, dollars here for the uh, underwater investigation of these four bridges, or five, I guess is no, four, um, uh, unbudgeted for. That's going to become an overage in particular. Um, has has Tatham said these need to be looked? Are they concerned about the substructure now, or just as an overall good practice to look at them? I mean. Uh, I, I hate overages and, and unplanned um, expenditures as we get into one project, but it just seems, uh, it, is it possible? What would happen if we delayed this for a year and put it into the 2023 budget? I think I, I did. Okay, uh, Ken, we're right ahead, sir. Yeah, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and the Mayor for the question. Um, the intention is to defer as many of the expenditures as possible into 2023 so as to not create an overage in the current year. Um, I, I would suggest to you that the, uh, there are uh, at least two of the additional in the investigations that can be avoided in the current year and uh, perhaps a third. Uh, I, I need to uh, take a better look at things uh, myself, um, but I, my intention is to defer as many uh, as possible to the 2023 uh, budget deliberations, and you can consider them consider them at that point in time. Good. Okay, Mayor, does that satisfy your question? Well, I guess just a supplemental then, because in this report I see four: or Morris Island Bridge, Doherty Road, Bala Bay, and Gross Dock. Um, of those four, are you anticipating those moving forward, or are those? what's your recommendation to defer or not defer in those particular ones? And I, I ask in, in twofold, number one, never want to get caught with a mistake. I mean, we've identified four bridges on a report right now that heaven forbid we deferred them and we had a failure of said uh, six months from now. Um, so I, I guess I'm really looking for what exactly are we doing? Are we not doing? In, in these particular ones. These are the identified ones that were not budgeted for the 65,000. Mr. Chairman, the only one that I, um, I would say that I'm really concerned about, and, and let me rephrase that. The only one that I'm, uh, I'm potentially concerned about is the, uh, uh, the condition of the Bala Bay Dock Bridge. Um, because it's a timber structure. Uh, 
I can't look at it today because of the snow and climatic conditions. But in the early spring, once the snow is gone, I'll have a look. And if, if I feel it's necessary, I will proceed with that, that item of work. And I will absorb that within my existing um, budget envelope. The remainder of the, the four investigations um, are being recommended because they simply haven't been able to be done and they can't see what's in the water. And the only way to get in to see is to get into the water. Um, the, the structures themselves are not exhibiting any uh, movement or, or cause for concern at the present time, but it is considered good practice and, and should be done I will say on a regular basis, not necessarily a frequent basis, but we'll, we'll make that decision once we see what the current state of the nation is. So I am not concerned about those being deferred to 2023 at this time. If anything changes, you folks will be the first to know. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillors uh, Edwards, and uh, Councillor uh, Jaglitz. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just like to say that I would agree with the underwater inspections. I think they're necessary for all uh, bridges when we're, we're, we're doing them. Uh, I'm reminded of the Russell River Bridge on uh, Highway 141 where they started work. And then a diver went down and found out it all washed out underneath and they had to it, it took twice as long getting that, that, that done. Had it been inspected first, they, they would have known. So uh, I would support that. And whenever they have to be done, they should be done. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, Councillor Jagwoods. Yes, very briefly, Chair. Uh, Chair I, I agree with the director's approach on this. I think it's a reasonable one. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, seeing no other hands, I'm going to read the, uh, the motion in front of us here. Uh, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it recommended that council authorize the completion of additional bridge inspections as recommended by Tatham Engineering Limited as detailed in report PW-2022-012. All those in favor? Carried. Good, that's carried unanimous, thank you. Okay, and our last report is again from Director uh, Becking as it relates to the Clean Muskoka Together program. You've got the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief. I just uh, brought this report to your attention. Um, the district has, has for a variety of very good and valid reasons, uh, opted to, to initiate a program um, which uh, uh, makes a previous program that was run by the township redundant. Um, and uh, it will not be exactly the same as the uh, as the previous township program. Um, you are likely, or you you may hear about it from your constituents. And I just wanted to draw it to your attention. Other than that, Mr. Chairman, uh, the report is for information purposes only. Okay, committee. Uh, there's uh, Councillor Roberts. You go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Through you very quickly. Um, and Director Becking, if you could relay to your colleagues at the district that um, um, the um, moving the moving the, the date from the Earth Day um, really wouldn't be that much of a, a gain since that would move it into Black Fly and mosquito season or whatever, and into uh, the period of time that people are, are coming up from the from from the the south to enjoy Muskoka. So that's the one point. I'm sorry, supportive of of eliminating um, uh, the free dumping day um, for all constituents. I think uh, if you collect hoard your 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 garbage to us or your to a point, you should pay for it to put it in. And um, like like anyone would do during the year, uh, the the final point I have, if they could come up, I know budgets are tight, but we're asking volunteers, and they're usually community volunteers, full time volunteers, to go out in the highways and in our community centers, and to clean up a mess that that we would not have to get our staff to do. 
and uh, if they could somehow come up with an, a little award program for local restaurants or something that, you know, all the volunteers' names would go in a hat and it would be drawn that uh, Sally Smith, uh, you know, helped clean up Highway 118 or the community center and, 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 and recognize all those volunteers that are, are helping to keep Muskoka clean. Thank you. Thank you. Good talk. Okay, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through you, I just want to support Councillor Roberts' idea of uh, getting some kind of recognition and maybe some kind of prize for the volunteers that are going out to help. Um, about the free dump day, though, I know a lot of people save their big items, um, mattresses, anything that they have replaced until the free dump day. And my fear is by removing the free dump day, you're going to find these items on the side of the road. Um, and I, I think that we will see some of the bigger items on the side of the road and then we'll have to deal with them anyway. So could the township consider continuing one day for a free dump day for the residents? Um, before I ask, uh... Councillor Edwards, I guess um, either uh, Ken, Director of Public Works, or the Mayor who Public Works from the district's perspective. I'm, I'm just one of you wants to speak to the issue. I mean, clearly it's a monetary one that would be that would be costs associated with Councillor Hayes' request of a dump day. So does anybody want to speak to that or we'll just go ahead? Anyone? I I I'll be honest. With the committee, Mr. Chairman, I, I share the councillor's concerns. Um, uh, I, I never bet for more than a loony, and I would, I'm would i more than prepared to bet my loony that, uh, uh, that we're going to see a fairly significant increase in the, uh, in the amount of um, waste that miraculously appears uh, on the side of our roads. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, at the end of the day, um, it it probably is the most expedient way to address the issue, but no, is not necessarily the best approach from a public policy point of view. And and I would encourage you uh, and to have staff encourage the district to work on a public policy approach as our first stab at it. Um, the concept of, of taking all of our of our waste and throwing it into a hole in the ground may be expedient, but it's not it's not good for the environment. It's not good public policy uh, as a statement of principle. Good. So so to your point, and before I ask Councillor uh, Edwards uh, to speak, um, you, what you're saying here is that the policy piece uh, this is a conscious decision by the district. This is not a cost saving measure. This is very clearly a diversionary <laughs> attempt at getting people to look at their waste in a, in a different format. So what is old isn't new again is what you're, what you're saying. Mary, you got your hand up. And then of course, Councillor Edwards, or I'll get to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and Director Becking said it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of twofold. Number one, there is a, a financial component to it. In round numbers, it's $10,000 uh, that our township was paying in the past. And number two, our landfill is filling up too fast. So when there's a cost associated with dumping, uh, people tend not to it or they think about other ways of managing their waste. Um, yes, there's always a risk that things end up on the side of the road but we would have to deal with that at that particular point. If we need to go back to this scenario, we would do that. Uh, I think uh, director pointed this out in the report. You know, the reality is when we do this in mid April, we don't have our seasonal residents up here um, and they're not necessarily using the free dump day. If we were to do it in the middle of the summer to make sure that all of our residents are equally treated, uh, we could be $10,000 uh, in cost uh, at the end of the day. So, um, really trying to manage our way through uh, solid waste. Um, you'll see some changes coming. Uh, we're going down to two bags a week for the rural uh, people at the end of April. So uh, start of the uh, summer season. And we really need to do that to make sure oh, my internet's unstable. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I see. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's a tough managing process, but our uh, landfills are filling up way too fast. So was the decision of uh, district okay. council. 
Okay, Councillor uh, Councillor Edwards, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to, to see this uh, program coming back in, even though it's uh, modified the volunteer to a great job. Uh, I know uh, one community center, I believe it was um, Allswater, when they had their uh, cleanup, uh, people used to go back and have lunch there and they uh, provided them maybe coffee and uh, cookies. Uh, if, if we could even, if any of the community centers wanted to do that, maybe we could uh, give them a pound of, uh, or a two of uh, coffee and some donuts or something like that for all the volunteers. So, and that, but it's just a thought, but uh, it is necessary. And since it's been about three years since the stuff has been picked up, there's gonna be a lot more garbage this year. And uh, just to, to, uh, to comment on the mayor uh, and that comment on, on, on the free day, I can remember when you used to put a dumpster in Windermere and it was the largest dumpster you could get and everybody just brought their stuff, uh, the contractors, everything else like that. There was hazardous waste and everything now went in it. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't go for something like that again and that, but, uh, and that, but you know, if you've got waste, you've got to get rid of it, whether it's free or, or, or not. And uh, you know, you're just not going to hang on to it forever if, it, if it's not free. So you're going to have it going in the landfill anyway, but just my thoughts. Thank you. Okay. So seeing no other comments and, and having heard them all, um, I'm going to read this resolution. Um, moved by uh, Councillor Jaglowitz, seconded by Councillor Kelly, be it resolved that report number PW-2022-014 be received for information purposes. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members committee. Yes, go ahead. Are you good? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, and with that, yes. Uh, have a have a day. Thank you for your participation this morning, Director Becking. Uh, I'm going to call on Chriselle, I believe, item 6A, which is a report from uh, her on the license agreement application, Ellis, roll number 4-11-077. Chriselle, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Javits, and good morning, committee. The township has, re has received a license agreement renewal application to recognize a dock that is situated on a portion of township road allowance. In 2002, the applicants were granted a 20 year license agreement for the encroachment, which is set to expire next month. Based on staff comments, it is recommended that approval be given subject to the noted conditions. And with that being said, I will turn it back to the chair. Good, thank you. Committee? Okay, no, no comments there. I have a, a motion in front of me here, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Bridgman, be it resolved that license agreement application number LA-01-22 Ellis be approved subject to the following conditions. Uh, one, that a draft numbered reference plan of survey be prepared and provided to the clerk for review within one year of the date of this conditional approval. Two, that the township be in receipt of the following from the acting solicitor. Uh, confirmation of a title search of the applicant is the owner of abutting land and that the encroachment is located on township land and a draft license agreement to the satisfaction of the township. Three, that the applicants provide proof of liability insurance covering the encroachments in the minimum amount of $2 million with the township named as additional insured. And four, payment of any applicable fees related to the preparation of the license agreement, including but not limited to the solicitor's time and disbursements, as well as confirmation of applicable property taxes have been paid up to date. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Carried Thank you. And Chriselle, you have item 6B, Jacques sale of an original road allowance. So go right ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the township has received an application for the sale of a portion of township road allowance from an abutting landowner. 
Based on staff comments, it is recommended that approval be given subject to the noted conditions. And with that being said, I will turn it back to the chair. Good, thank you. Okay, committee, any uh, comment? Okay, I've got a lengthy one to read here. Moved by Councilman Ishikawa, seconded by Councilor Edwards. Be it resolved that original road allowance application ORA 0322 Jacques be approved subject to the following conditions. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor Edwards, I apologize. Go ahead, yeah, just a clarification. It looks like it's a dead end road. I don't know if that's plowed in the uh, winter or not, but uh, is there a turnaround there for, for, for the plow? That's the only uh, concern I would have. Other than that, I don't have a problem with it. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Chrishell? Thank you, Chair. Um, the Public Works Department did a site visit and confirmed that the plow turnaround is farther up the road. That is correct, that it is a dead end road. Councilor Edwards, you good with that? Oh, he's frozen. Are we frozen? Some, the mayor is. No, the mayor's not. Okay, okay. <laughs> there you go. A little Zoom humor there. Okay, I'm gonna read this item. Item one: that the town that the township be in receipt of correspondence from the landowner of roll number four dash eight dash zero four four, abutting the portion of the township road allowance to be closed within sixty days of the conditional approval of this application. The correspondent shall confirm or waive their interest in the northerly thirty three foot portion of the township road allowance. Two, upon confirmation of the landowner of roll number 4-8-044, confirming or waiving their interest in acquiring the 33-foot portion of the township road allowance to be closed, a corresponding draft numbered reference plan of survey shall be prepared and provided to the clerk for review within one year of the date of this conditional approval. Three, that a right of way in favor of property roll number 4-8-044 over the lands be provided if applicable. And uh, four, uh, one confirmation that public notice of the proposed disposition was published pursuant to township policy C-LS-06. Two, confirmation that the District of Muskoka and other applicable agencies have no concerns with the proposed disposition and that three, a road closing bylaw, the declaration of surplus resolution and any related necessary documentation to affect the disposition. Four, or sorry, five, a payment of any applicable fees for the land costs, solicitor's time and disbursements, as well as confirmation applicable property taxes have been paid up to date. All those in favor? Good. That's unanimous. Thank you and thank you, Chriselle. Um, okay, item 6C, it's our clerk. Uh, Lauren Tarasik is going to talk to us about the council, hybrid council meetings. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Ms. Hollows to queue up uh, the per presentation. Perfect. Okay, and everyone can hear me? We're good. Okay, thank you committee. So I'm here before you today uh, to ask committee to provide some sort of direction or consensus on options to then come back to this committee in the future uh, with a further report and investigation. So with this presentation, um, I'm going to review some of the history, some of the background of um, how we, we got here today and present a number of options to potential hybrid Councillor committee meetings going forward and some considerations uh, to take into account when making that decision. Next slide, please. Do you think we can expand this to the full? Oh, that's okay. We're, we're good with the, the part screen. It's a good thing this presentation is about technology. Yeah, this is a hybrid. 
If you just click the plus button, we'll zoom in a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, just leave it at 75. That seems to be the magic. <laughs> okay, that's okay. We'll just leave it as it is. Okay, I'm going to try off PowerPoint. Is that working? Okay, hopefully everybody can see that a little bit better. Perfect. Okay, so to take a, a walk through memory lane here with some of the legislation that came into play in early 2020, in the early days of the pandemic. So back on March 19th, 2020, the Ontario government made amendments to the Municipal Act in response to COVID-19. Bill 187, the Municipal Emergency Act, actually temporarily allowed municipalities to update procedural bylaws uh, for councils and committees and local boards. In April 15th, uh, 2020, at a special council meeting, council adopted a bylaw to amend the uh, township's procedural bylaw to allow for electronic meetings and emergencies. As time progressed on July 21st of that same year, the Ontario government made further amendments to permanently allow for quorum for electronic meetings outside of an emergency, so post-pandemic life. On August 6, 2020, Council met a special council meeting to again pass a bylaw concerning additional amendments to the procedural bylaw to allow for electronic participation protocols for council and committee meetings. And so uh, as a result of these changes, the procedural bylaw for the township as it now stands allows for electronic participation at section 2.21. So section 2.21, to 1.1 indicates that an electronic meeting may be conducted pursuant to section 238 of the act in accordance with this section and the electronic participations protocol. So if a meeting is held in person, a member is permitted to participate electronically. When participating electronically, that member will be counted for the purposes of quorum and should be entitled to vote as if they were attending the meeting in person and participate electronically in a meeting that is open or closed to the public. So that's the procedural bylaw as it stands today, which allows um, a member of full rights, both voting and towards quorum for any council and committee meetings. So as time progressed, we've seen various public health measures that have been implemented by the province. On March 1st, 2020, the province of Ontario made changes to public and workplace safety measures, including lifting capacity limits on indoor public health settings, Proof of vaccination requirements have been lifted. Other protective measures such as face and masks covering requirements and passive screening remain in place today. Uh, business and organizations that are open must continue to have safety plans in place. As you are aware, uh, back on March 7th of this year, the municipal office fully reopened to the public in response to the province of Ontario easing the public health restrictions. And uh, the Ontario government appears poised to continue to ease restrictions. That's the messaging that we have heard thus far. So uh, on February 28th, 2022, Dr. Charles Gardner, the medical officer of health for the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, wrote municipalities highlighting the need for caution to ensure the transmission and hospitalization continue to decrease in this region. Dr. Gardner recommended that the following, uh, the following measures be taken for councils that resume in-person meetings. Those are to provide options for virtual attendance for staff and council or the public who choose not to return as a precaution against COVID-19, to limit the attendance of, council, of the council chambers to the number of people that can physically distance by two meters or more, 
that staff and council should use masks or face coverings in chambers when they're not speaking, and further to ensure that HVAC systems are maintained in accordance with manufacturer recommendations. So just so everyone is aware of where um, other municipalities nearby stand, so far Lake of Bays has returned to a hybrid format. Huntsville, Bracebridge, Gravenhurst, and Georgian Bay, uh, as of the time of this presentation, remain completely virtual. Uh, there is a screenshot here from the township of Lake of Bays, just so you can see how their council chambers is set up. And of course, at the township, we have some of our own considerations. So uh, unlike some other municipalities, we've been operating in a modified hybrid format with the chairs um, and for council meetings, the mayor and limited staff actually attending the council chambers distanced. The format has been operational, but as you've seen from time to time, there are some connectivity issues with the technology we currently have. And you have some considerations to take into account. Obviously, masking requirements continue to exist right now where individuals cannot socially distance. The current chamber space doesn't allow for the social distancing of 10 counselors and staff in its current format. And the council chambers has basic technology without any upgraded functionality to improve the functionality of hybrid meetings. And I included a photo here so you can remember what it's like to sit this closely to other people. So there are some options and we're looking for some direction of what to further investigate. So the option one, number one is to remain with the status quo and that is a modified hybrid format. So we can continue council and committee meetings with the chair and limited staff in attendance in person. Additional staff, council and the public will continue to attend on Zoom. Obviously this would be uh, at no additional cost to the township. Committee could choose to revisit uh, and ask us to come back with other investigations or reports when additional information is available concerning public health guidelines, including but not limited to an update on the physical distancing guidelines. And there would need to be no changes to the procedural rules as we outlined. We have electronic meeting protocol and um, we have amended our procedural bylaw to allow for hybrid attendance. So the second option before you is to investigate enhanced hybrid options. So the council chambers as it stands currently has a basic bird's eye view camera. And that's similar to the picture from the uh, Lake of Bays that you saw with sort of like an overhead view. There's also a pull down screen in this chambers and a microphone system. The system isn't well integrated and it's not uh, exactly functional or efficient for smooth expanded hybrid meetings. If directed, staff could investigate additional technology, including but not limited to other cameras, other screens to facilitate members of council or the public or delegates coming in um, and being visible to the members of council that are in this chamber. Uh, an AV vendor, vendor could be engaged quickly if we were directed to sole source this or an RFP could be initiated pursuant to the township's procurement policy. Uh, the procedural rules could be amended based on public health guidance. If uh, distancing continues to be a requirement, committee might consider a hybrid function where a rotating roster of counselors are permitted, which would allow for distancing. And I just want to review some investigations that occurred previously before my time concerning the movement of the council chambers to the Port Carling Community Center. And some committee members will recall this. So in light of changing public health guidance and anticipated cost of a big transition in the face of uncertainty of the lockdowns and reopening, committee or council did not direct the movement of council chambers to the Port Carling Community Center as of yet. So you'll just provide a bit of background on that. Uh, the pandemic obviously began in March, 2020. In July, 2020, council first considered the reopening framework, which included the use of digital services and electronic meetings. 
In August 2020, uh, the direction from council was to provide better connectivity to the Port Carling Community Center. And this improved connectivity to the Port Carling Community Center served multiple purposes. Provided connectivity if council meetings were eventually required to be moved due to public health restrictions. It also provided better connectivity if we have overflow meetings in the future that were to be held there. And it generally provided connectivity to community groups who may use that facility. We updated council that hardwiring was completed in the summer of 2021. And there were discussions in November, 2021 that indicated that in-person meetings would be further delayed to late 2021 or 2022 due to health unit recommendations and options. And as you'll recently remembered, remember, sorry, we went back to a uh, semi-lockdown in January, 2022. And so no movement happened. Uh, for clarity, staff have not proceeded with further upgrades to the community center to facilitate any movement of the chamber. Direction has not been given by council or uh, committee. And further, it may not be desirable uh, from committee to direct that move in light of the potential easing of restrictions. Want to clarify any confusion and remind committee that a space optimization study was reviewed by committee in September of 2021. The resolution that was ratified by council in October 2021 authorized the alternative approach as outlined in that report. And that alternative approach was less costly and did not authorize the movement of council chambers to the Port Carling Community Center. So I've included some examples uh, of potential hybrid setups that have increased functionality. So this is actually the uh, town of Collingwood. And you can see there's uh, a hybrid meeting with a, a, a sort of more of a close up view of particular counselors and staff and the public being integrated on Zoom in the same screen. This is another example. There are some plastic or plexiglass barriers between counselors and counselors in person and both um, at home, sort of integrated into a screen format here as well. And so obviously there's a third option and that's to eventually remove virtual options and require in-person attendance only. So this would require an amendment to the procedural bylaw from a safety standpoint, would remind committee that it'd only be possible if the physical distancing requirements were amended uh, and public health guidance allowed us to do so. There'd be no further cost implications, but there may be access issues. The public and delegates, uh, delegates that we've uh, had at the township have enjoyed a greater level of access to council and committee meetings with the option of attending in Zoom. Most other municipalities, many that we've seen are continuing to allow this level of public participation via virtual platforms. And have found uh, success with sort of engagement through these virtual platforms. So we are asking for some direction today on uh, avenues to explore and happy to answer any of your questions. I'm just gonna take this down so that I can see the screen. Okay, committee. So thank you for that, uh, clerk. Very excellent presentation. Uh, lots to think about. Um, this can be a really short discussion or it can be an incredibly long one. So um, I guess based on that, I see three hands. Uh, Councillor Bridgman first, then Councillor Kelly, then Councillor Hayes. So Councillor Bridgman, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Zavitz, and thank you, Lauren, for that presentation. It reminded us all of the timing, if nothing else. Um, I, I personally think that we can reject option three completely, which means we go back to exactly where we were. I see some heads going yes. And so my, my um, preference would be to continue with what we've got now, which is the hybrid approach and uh, it'll allow councillors to be not physically in Muskoka if they want to uh, be part of this. So I think I, what I'm looking at is um, option one or option two. And um, 
I think we need to upgrade the equipment definitely in the chamber. I think the big question is, do we invest in moving to the community center or not and do the upgrade there? Um, I guess I have a question. Could we stay where we are now? And in terms of the public, and we're only allowed X number and you know some of our meetings get way more than that. Could we have a hybrid even for the public? Some are here and some can still come in via Zoom. Maybe you can answer that for me, Lauren. That would be my preference if we could do that. Lauren. Thank you and through you, Chair. Um, we could investigate allowing a hybrid model for public participation as well. Really right now, it seems that the public health guidance is a bit in flux. Um, we have seen some signaling from the province. Uh, we have heard some signaling from our uh, local district of health, or district of uh, local medical officer of health. And, um, you know, you can't help but follow with the news. And it does seem like there is some positive news and some words of caution as well when it comes to um, flexing and easing of restrictions. So it's something we can look at, um, we can investigate, and it's really going to, I think, depend on what happens March 21st or April 1st and whether it would be safe to proceed with that, but it's something we can definitely investigate. I have just one one clarification. Um, sorry, Chair Savitz. I was looking to the future when we don't have any more restrictions left. I, I think that's where I went because now we're under whatever's happening. So, um, so those were my comments. Yeah, thank you. And and uh, to that point, before I invite the others, um, one might wonder whether we shouldn't be looking at this 30 days from now with a clearer lens um, as opposed to right here and now. So I, I think that's certainly in my discussions with, um, with staff uh, pre this meeting, um, they're looking for a sense as to where we'd like to see the future go. And I think it's hard to prognosticate when we don't, we don't know what that future, future holds. So uh, given that, I'm gonna call on uh, Councillor Kelly uh, anyway, you can see how many are here. So, Councillor Kelly, for us, we'll move across. Thank you. Thank you, and through you, uh, I guess a question first. I, 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 the problem I've had with uh, the environment under which we've been operating for over two years now is I don't know what several words that seem important really mean. And I'm talking about the words guidance, recommendation, law, and mandates. Uh, I don't know how much of those are just warm suggestions, how much of them are punishable, uh, you know, for offenses. So I actually don't know what latitude we have right now to make a decision. I, I, again, I went through your report the other day, saw it again on the screen now, recommends wearing masks. I don't know what a recommendation is. Um, my view on this is that uh, as soon as practically possible, as soon as we can do so safely and uh, do so within the uh, strict confines of whatever law governs our behavior. I think we need to get back together in one room and carry on our business the way we carried on when we were first uh, elected to this role. I don't think we're there yet, but I also don't know what that looks like. I don't know when that happens. Um, I also understand that different people have different concerns for the safety of something like that. And so uh, as, as much as it might be an expensive undertaking, that council chamber, uh, I can remember several meetings in there when it was claustrophobically tight for, for space. Uh, I can remember watching uh, delegates, uh, citizen delegates coming in after the meeting started and having to basically step over each other to get to an empty chair. So uh, somehow maybe we need to look at the expense of and, and understand what the expense would be to move it to uh, a bigger accommodation and whether that's temporarily over in the community center, I don't know. But uh, I don't think we're ever gonna get to the point where everybody's 100% comfortable. But I honestly think that our goal should be to get back in one room, meet as a, as a group, as a, I hate the word team, but meet, meet as an organization, um, and uh, dispense with the technology, dispense with, you know, me yelling into a computer screen, hoping everybody can hear me. And that's okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. And if I might just be so bold as to, as I go across the screen, uh, Councillor Kelly, are you suggesting that right now 
given what I heard you say that you're you're fine with status uh, status quo for the for the I, moment. I think status I think status quo works for now, um, and uh, and I don't know for how long. I mean, I, it'll work fine forever. But our goal should be to to find our way clear to get back into a, a common space. I think. I, just to, so to that point, before I go on, my question would be to staff here. Um, you know, I'm hearing there there are equipment equipment deficiencies in this council chamber. Uh, the biggest deficiency is the internet quality. That's to, to my mind. If we if we had uh, a more fulsome internet uh, signal, we wouldn't have half the problems that we do. I, I'm not so sure it's cameras and it's other things, but as it relates to this particular room. Um, Am I incorrect in thinking that we, I mean, we do have cameras, we do have the technology we're here and, and now experiencing it. Is it not really the internet signal that's our biggest issue here in this building? Just for status quo, Lauren? Yeah, so I think there's a number of issues that we can investigate further. Uh, you saw some of the photos of how other councils are set up and there's an issue with the integration of Zoom, the cameras, bringing in delegates, hosting webinars, turning on and off the microphone, hearing that feedback. There's ways to make the facilitation of these meetings easier. And in turn, um, we also need to look at the con connectivity and what yeah. platforms we can actually host. And, and so one question that I, that I hope to get some clarity on is, even if we're remaining status quo for the time being, uh, is committee wanting to investigate better technology either here or in the community center or both? Or are we content to park that for now, knowing that it might take some months to do that in the future? Okay, that's the task in front of us this morning. Okay, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through you. Um, I think the method that we're using right now is safe for everybody. It seems to be working. There are a few technical glitches from time to time, but for the most part, it works rather well. It allows the public to come in safely. It allows us to work safely. I think until we hear in the future that there are, um, that the safety requirements are lessened so that we can actually work in our own community uh, council chambers. I think that we should continue with what we're doing right now. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, certainly, you know, we are functioning uh, through this virtual model that we are right now. I agree with Councillor Kelly that we need to get back um, to in-person meetings. The one caveat to that is the province has made it very clear that even though we may be in person, electronic participation is now a new norm and possible. So either we throw that out of our bylaw and say no longer can you count as quorum electronically and you must be in these chambers, um, as my internet is unstable, hopefully you can continue to hear me, the, um, I, I think we need to look at some form of a hybrid option. Um, and I think that's where the clerk is going in this particular case. Um, no question right now for the next 30 days, maybe 60 days, maybe 90 days, we can continue in this technology. Uh, the fact is overflow meetings, yes, we can move them. We're going to have 100 people here. We can move the technology over to the community center. Um, and I think it's going to be a bit of a moving target, but I think we do need to investigate what we'll call enhanced hybrid options. The other thing I, I would ask council's question, because right now, according to the municipal act, if we miss three meeting cycles in a row, we are no longer on council. I think the reality for myself is that I don't, I wouldn't want a council to strictly spend a term virtually or a counselor to strictly spend a term of counsel virtually online. Um, miss a cycle or you know, have a cycle virtual or two cycles virtual, but I think the third cycle that somewhere we need to connect face to face going forward to make it, you know, it, it's the norm that we are in the council chamber and the exception 
that we are at home virtually or wherever it is. Um, and I, I think we might want to put some form of legislation, that'd be my opinion, into our own procedural bylaw that would allow a couple of virtual meetings, but then we need to get ourselves into that council chamber. Um, you know, health reasons at, at eight o'clock in the morning, you get up ready to come to the council chamber and you've got a cold, who knows if it's COVID, what it is, it makes sense to stay home virtually and protect everybody else. Um, you know, again, if we want to be away on vacation with our families, we have the ability to take a morning and zoom into a meeting and uh, make that functional. But again, I don't think that should be every single day. So my option, I think, to the clerk, just to be specific, is to investigate what we call option two, enhanced hybrid options that would explain how some of council could be in a council chamber, some of public could come in, and how we could integrate both platforms of live and virtual to work seamlessly together. And that meant also to, I think, uh, Chair Zavitt's comments, how does the uh, internet play into that where are we at? Uh, all of those. So, you know, I don't think we're ready to make a full decision today, but I think over the next 30 days and 60 days that uh, the clerk's office could provide us with some alternatives that we could vote on. Good, good common ground there. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, first of all, I, I, I'm very supportive of staff going out and understanding what other uh, uh, counts, uh, municipalities are doing to improve their 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 communications and 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 technology so that we can continue forever um, in some uh, of uh, of remote uh, remote meetings. Um, the the so that that's the first thing we we've got to figure out what it's going to cost. Um, we're in a very as someone indicated our current council chair very very small. And uh, we've got to get out of that. If we, if we started the, putting the technology in to get in over to the community center, there was idea behind it. We should understand what that's going to take. So it's a larger area. And uh, so we don't have to move on, on a whim um, or on, on, on ad hoc move over. Um, so I, I think the idea of a hybrid, now start right away, start, start learning, grow with it where uh, meetings are opened up with councillors who wish who can and wish to be in the council meeting can can be there. Um, and then the, with a the hybrid, like I think we talked six and six or something like that. Um, personally, um, there's no date that I can see right now that I would ever come back into council given my personal health issues. So um, that's a concern I have right now. Um, it, it could be alleviated in the next few months, but um, uh, right now, personally, uh, I would not be I would not be comfortable uh, getting in um, in a close proximity in the current council setup. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Mazen. Uh, thank you, and through you, um, I would just like to echo the comments. I think by the mayor, I think it's important that we start to explore. I would say I'm looking at option number two, um, a hybrid solution. From a council standpoint, I think we have to acknowledge that a significant part of our population actually doesn't live full time up north. And I've seen personally on the Economic Development Committee, we've had a member who has participated from the US and it has been a huge value to that. So I think that we really need to make sure we're understanding um, our audience as we look um, at, at trying to understand from a council standpoint. The second, uh, second piece that I wanted to bring up as a um, member of the public I think that uh, the, there's been a significant increase in access to our meetings uh, that has made it much easier for more people to participate and understand. And certainly if you have a personal application, historically, one of two things would have happened if you're a seasonal resident or not in the one, you would send an applicant, um, or sorry, not an applicant, you would send somebody in on, a professional in on your behalf to present your application um, if you were not physically able to go or two, you would have to drive for at least a couple of hours in order to come and participate. That has become much simpler and it's something I've heard from a lot of people that it's now easier, much easier for people to participate um, from a public standpoint. So um, I'm in favor of the option number two, exploring the options, not necessarily making a decision, but um, exploring the, op uh, the options today. And if it would be okay with you, Chair Zavitz, uh, I don't want to sideline this conversation, but I have one more comment slash question 
at the tail end of this uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Edwards and then Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Zavich. Um, I would stay with option one at this time. Um, you know, it, it, we'll have to wait and see what happens after midwinter break when everybody's been traveling around. There, there uh, could be uh, an upswing in, in cases that we don't know. But um, as long as uh, the um, province lets us have hybrid uh, meetings on, on that, we should never, ever force a councillor to have to come in every third, third, third meeting and that some people have uh, health issues they may not want to discuss and that, um, and it's a free country. You've seen what happened in Ottawa and that with all the uh, protesters and that. Well, some of the ones that aren't, aren't uh, may maybe protesting have a, a, a good reason for, for maybe not wanting to, to come back. So I would never support that. But as of now, I would stay with option one and we can definitely investigate option two. I don't have a problem coming in and that, uh, but uh, we also have to think of our staff because if the public are starting to come, more, more people coming in, it exposes staff as well. So I would stay with option one uh, until everything clears up. Thank you. Okay, good, good thoughts. Um, okay, Councillor Jaglitz, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. I support the comments of the last two councillors. I think that's important that uh, we not penalize people if they have health issues. And I think the hybrid approach is the right approach. And, but my, my main concern is for the public. I think the public should always have access uh, remotely uh, because there are that, that, that large population that, that can't make it personally. But I also think there are other members of the public that can't handle the technology. So I think you have to provide for that. And the best way is to let them attend in person if possible. If not, there has to be some way for their views also to be supported. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Okay, Councillor Rosanne, you had an alternative thought or question? Well, thank you. And uh, I didn't want to um, sideline the discussion on whether we continue along the hybrid approach, um, but I wanted to pick up on a comment that the mayor had made. Um, this has been on my, while, uh, on my mind even pre-COVID, but the reality is we have, um, uh, we're currently sitting here in March break. And uh, we continue to schedule our meetings around a pretty important family vacation time, as well as family day. And I just wouldn't like staff to perhaps explore, um, is there an opportunity to, for us to look at a different way of scheduling some of our meetings? Again, I'm not looking for the answer today, but I think it's really important to note that we're trying to attract a lot of different types of people and voices, um, but taking it away from even the council, uh, from staff, uh, there's a lot of them who probably are not able to have your traditional March break simply because of the scheduling issues. So um, with that said, I, I was just simply wondering, uh, and maybe this is a question for Lauren or Director Hammond, if it's possible for us to just look at the schedule and see if there's an alternate way for us to approach um, around uh, some family, family vacation time. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna let Lauren's happy to speak on this. Thank you. Something that can be explored, definitely. Obviously, council and committee meetings are set um, quite, quite far in advance and uh, the school board schedule is not always set as far in advance. So sometimes it's difficult to know or predict when exactly March break will fall. But if there is an issue with scheduling, uh, we just remind, all committee members and councillors to reach out to the clerk's office and we are happy to help brainstorm ways to sort of deal with them. So thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure we're gonna be having more of that discussion because uh, I think that sensitivity does need to be dialed in. And I, I you know, it's not on deaf ears that some of the councillors are, suggesting that they you know they don't ever want to come to a, a, li a live meeting if you will and they have their own reasons for that and i think there's there needs to be i'm going to use the word again sensitivity to to that i'm not sure how i feel about it but it's not up to me and it's up to all of us together and in that collective i i would look to you all here and now i, I think what i'm hearing and if, tell me if i'm wrong and i'll i'll ask you to 
nod your head or thumbs up or something that while we're obviously we're in a status quo situation, aren't we? We're, we're sort of um, treading water. We're waiting for results from uh, and government uh, directives and mandates. So right here and now we're, we're in a status quo situation. And, and one might believe that it looks to be for the next, I don't know, let's pick a date, 30 days. Um, so while we're here in option one, um, certainly there seems to be an appetite to explore um, this hybrid piece, which would be the option two aspect. So I see no reason why we probably couldn't do a, um, a do them both, if, if I might, to be so bold. Um, you know, clearly we know where we are. We've agreed that we're in, we're, we're in, we're in a holding pattern. And uh, I know that's where I am. I know that's where my family is. Um, and I, although I'm hearing that there should be, could be, would be an opportunity to see where uh, where some of the other possibilities lie. And, uh, you know, I did see, um, you know, our clerk nod her head yes, as if to say that um, it's possible to work in, in concert. So if I could look to you as a committee, is that generally a feeling that you've got that uh, we, we sort of, our lot is what it is for this moment, uh, but it's changing. It may well change rapidly and it could go either way. Um, that, that smart money is that we should be looking at uh, some sort of hybrid options as it relates to that, that that option two piece. Is that something that I can get some sort of consensus from you on? I'm seeing generally thumbs up. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. Is that? I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let our clerk uh, ask a question. So I just want to clarify a bit of direction so we can go out and bring back um, a useful investigative report here. But uh, is the desire to sort of look at potential hybrid options, or at least the costing thereof for both the current chamber and potentially the Port Carling Community Center? And do we want to go and ask, you know, for example, one AV company, or are we putting this out through a procurement process? Okay, um, we'll ask the councillors. Here you go, Councillor Kelly, go ahead. Uh, thank you, and through you. I just, just uh, hopefully uh, to, to, to try to make it a little bit, the burden a little bit easier. I, I think focusing 30 days at a time isn't gonna work. Uh, I think we, we might wanna subscribe to the current system for months. Uh, and, um, but use that time to figure out what happens when the restrictions are off and the, and the ability to get back together in one room exists. And I'm going to suggest that may actually be after the end of this term. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know, but I don't think we can do any kind of planning 30 days out when we're looking at the possibility of AV upgrades. We're looking at the possibility of, uh, uh, uh you know, well, audio, video, everything upgrading, uh, I, I really don't think we're going to get this one solved in 30, 60, or even 90 days. Um, but during that time, we could get a couple of reports generated, figure out what the expense is going to be, and, and make a, a wiser decision then than we are able to make right now. Okay, good. So to your to our, our clerk's question, your answer would be yes. <laughs> to go, you know, with the there is a myriad of options, and. Um, You'd like to see a selector, if you will, uh, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I would imagine one could make those discre discrete inquiries and capture that kind of information and bring it back to committee in, in 30 days, you know, in, in that regard. And again, um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to ask the CAO to comment. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, members of the committee. So I, I think what I'm hearing uh, based on what Councillor uh, Kelly provided a bit of clarity on is, is you want staff to investigate this. We'll continue with the current sort of remote or virtual approach. Uh, staff will do some investigations and come back at our, at, at our earliest opportunity to sort of uh, outline a sort of cost range, if you will, for getting out of the council chamber alternatively the uh, community center uh, and then we can move forward from there with respect to a, your decision on the the approach slash uh, a sole sourcing or an rfp uh, approach now bear in mind um, that uh, we're of the understanding from a technology perspective that it's taking some time to get 
technology in place based on supply chain issues. So if you do uh, decide to single source, that's going to be a, a time frame. Uh, obviously, if you decide to go into an RFP, that may add additional time. Um, but certainly, uh, we're happy to uh, look at that and report back on that basis, if, if that's sort of the consensus of direction. Good, and I, th I think that's where we are. Uh, from what my, my sense is, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Nishikawa and Councillor Jaglitz, and then we'll wrap this up. I just wanted to add that um, we've, ha we've had issues for, I'm going to go 15 years or more. Um, the fact that we have to move to the Port Curran Community Centre for many, many meetings. And this, I don't, I don't want to make this um, issue about COVID. This has been a long time problem with the Port Carlin Community Center and our ability to, to house large meetings. Um, so I think it is something that we have to move forward on and get quotes in, whatever that would be. I would suggest that if, for instance, if it was under the 25,000, I have no idea what kind of the costs are going to be involved. And, you know, uh, I would actually in that way have to look at staff um, to tell us whether it fits in whatever policies that we have. Um, I don't believe that this can happen in the next month or two. Uh, I would hope though that our council, you know, I, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm weekly curling with people, uh, large numbers of people. I'm with large numbers of people. I'm going to be, uh, I've attended some other things. Um, I, I, I would hope others are going to start moving on because Muskoka is not, we are not Simcoe. And I, I do understand others are going to have a different reaction and things, but I do listen to also my constituents. And they don't feel like they're part of um, what's going on. Yes, they can sit and look at the videos and things, but there is a lot to be said for an in-person meeting. Um, I just don't think that, uh, I found it very interesting to watch the, the, the federal meeting yesterday, having a packed house. How did they do that? You know, kind of thing. Like, do we, I, I would just say that we should not be looking at this being the norm till the end of the year. I think we should be focused about the taxpayers and what we are providing for the taxpayers. Um, but again, I, I, I think we really do need to focus on the Port Carlin Community Center and council chambers as both. Um, the reality is, is that we can't rebuild our, our township hall uh, in, even in the next five years sort of thing. But the reality is we do need to use the Port Carlin Community Center. Okay, good, thank you. And I think to, to your point, Councilor Nishikawa, uh, Lauren has, uh, our clerk has spoken to the, and the uh, option two, that, that one of the considerations would be the community center and uh, the machinations around how we could uh, equip and or re-equip that to better handle uh, those larger meetings. Because I don't think we're having the, today as I understand it, the status quo option, which is option one. I don't think we're having the bigger COVID discussion, Councilor Nishikawa, that you raise. I mean, certainly that you're out in the community as we, we all are. Um, here we are in the public and we never know when, when 100 people will show up for a particular event and then we can't hold it. And uh, that would mean the community center is certainly here is certainly a, an excellent vehicle and perhaps that should be where we should go on a full-time basis. So, um, I, I mean, more on that as we, uh, as this unfolds. Councillor uh, Jaglitz and then the mayor and then we'll wrap it up. Oh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm trying to stick to the questions the clerk answer, uh, asked and one was whether we should look at the council chamber or the community center. And I think we should look at the council chamber first because with the ability for the hybrid system, we may, there's two kinds of people that attend from the public. There's those that live nearby and they like to come and sit and socialize. And there are those that live afar and come out of, the, out of necessity to support. We may find the hybrid may solve the problem. The second part you asked about single source or uh, um, uh, RFP. 
I, I'm very leery of single source just out of principle. And if we can avoid it, we should. And for those of you that disagree with me, you should read the Collingwood inquiry that's attached to this minutes and see what single source uh, has brought that, that community. And we thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Harding. Thank you. And uh, I think we're definitely uh, status quo from our meetings virtually right now for the next 30, 60, 90 days, who knows how long. Um, but I think certainly uh, our clerk is going to investigate in council chamber, maybe in um, the community center. I'm sure, you know, we do have the technology over there, at least the internet broadband <clears throat> to be able to upgrade that um, from a uh, single source perspective. Um, I, I respect the issues with an RFP as this is going forward um, as to where we go. Uh, and I'm going to look to the clerk it, you know, if we, this goes out for RFP, are we six months, are we eight months down the road before we can get anything really done? Um, and are we a little more nimble if uh, we do a, a single source? We, we have single source and I appreciate Country Jaguars' comments, um, but we're in sort of uncharted waters here as we move forward and try to uh, address, best address the public. The one thing I will say, and it's not for discussion today, I, I brought it up before and I heard uh, Councilor Roberts and Councilor Edwards, you know, say, hey, we should allow people to all the time meet virtually um, because of health issues and everything. I think the reality is one of our jobs as counselors is to interact with the public as best we can. And the best interaction is always going to be somewhat in person to go out and visit sites, to understand the realities of our municipality. Um, and I, no one on this Zoom screen or no one who's run the past for council has ever shied away from some kind of public interaction. Uh, my only fear would be we end up with someone who wants to just sit at home in their office and not fully interact with public and just comment uh, via Zoom screen. So don't have to answer that today. Um, and I certainly respect health issues and problems that are going on. But as I stated, it, it should be the norm, if possible, that we interact in public and in person versus a virtual council going forward. Because I think that truly changes the way uh, government is run. And uh, I would hate to lose that personal interaction as we go forward. Even this discussion, you know, reading people's body languages, trying to look at 10 people around the chamber is difficult sometimes. So, and if, do you freeze, do you not freeze? So um, not a discussion today, but just something uh, I personally would like to have a consideration given to going forward. Okay, good, thank you. And again, all of this is for the record and we're all hearing it, we're all pondering it, I can tell. And I can say that um, I, I do not have a resolution to read on this. This is the temperature uh, taking that uh, we're doing, uh, that staff is doing. And I'm certainly sensing that uh, as we've discussed, uh, status quo for the moment, um, option two, which is the hybrid, it should be explored. And um, I know that the, the clerk is making her notes. I'm not suggesting that we'd be going out to an RFP or any such scenario at this point in time, but certainly gathering the information so that we they can come back and make, we can make and look at and make some decisions on this based on uh, that intelligence. So um, with that, I'm gonna look to you all to sort of nod and say, you know, you're, you're in agreement. If you're harshly against or opposed to that, then, uh, I guess we'll continue on with this discussion here and now, or we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. So um, committee, are you comfortable with uh, our, our clerk is gonna go away and come back and look at that hybrid option number two in terms of uh, information about that. But in the, in the meantime, here we are here and now. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, good, seeing that. Okay, moving on then, thank you committee for that. Item 6D, which is a report from our CAO uh, regarding the amending of the CAO bylaw. Derek? Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. So this report involves an update to the CAO bylaw. As you know, it currently provides the authority to the CAO to establish administrative policies. And recently to that end, I've worked with the clerk to create a policy approach to streamline our committee and council agenda building process, which has actually achieved good results in terms of ensuring that staff don't need to stay late on Fridays posting agendas. 
So from a health and safety perspective, as you can probably appreciate, the CAO is the accounted, accountable administrative position and there are a number of health and safety policies and directives which require updates. So some of the things that um, would be involved in include things like uh, violence and harassment uh, prevention policies for staff, first aid, uh, hazard and incident accident reporting, accident uh, incident investigations, personal protective equipment, some of the practices that we would uh, need to update and uh, look uh, at things like working alone, ladder safety, working over water, various equipment procedures. So with that in mind, to maximize the efficiency of committee and council time, staff should be able to complete these updates and the proposed bylaw amendment clarifies the authority to do so. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions. Glenn, you're on mute. Oh, that was beautiful too. <laughs> I do have a resolution here. Moved by Councillor Mazan, uh, seconded by Councillor Hayes, be it resolved that committee approved draft of bylaw 2022-049 and that it be forwarded to council for ratification. All those in favor? Good, sure. thank you, that's carried. Okay, item uh, 6E, uh, verbal report from the CAO as it relates to COVID-19 operations. How timely. Thank you, Derek, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, given the discussion about um, uh, return to council meetings, uh, the recent public health announcements, we thought it was timely just to update uh, committee on um, what's happening with respect to our facilities, et cetera. And uh, as it relates to those facilities, as you know, they're now available and open to the public. Uh, and with the removal of the masking requirement on uh, March 21st, other than passive screening, signage and optional masking, uh, there'll be no applicable public health restrictions unless advised by public health that they're needed again. So then as it relates to the office, um, working through two years of varying COVID health restrictions required our staff team to pivot and provide alternative methods uh, other than providing in-person service to the public. And while a lot of organizations worked completely remotely throughout the pandemic, um, our staff adapted to a hybrid work model so we had anchor days in the office and remote days, and our service to the public remained relatively seamless. Having said that, I want to recognize that approximately 40% of our full-time workforce continued to work in person delivering services such as snow removal, parks, maintenance, et cetera, throughout the pandemic. So needless to say, I'm extremely proud of uh, and want to thank staff for their efforts during, during the last two years. So you've probably heard um, media descriptions of with the lifting of, of public health restrictions, the federal government, the province and other municipalities are complete, contemplating a return to work. And it's interesting to see that they're implementing hybrid arrangements. So when you think back to what we had done over, over the last two years, we're actually ahead of the curve. Um, because we've been working or using a hybrid approach for the last two years. So arguably, it is now part of our work culture. And we're proposing to continue with that approach. So in anticipation of an influx of in-office attendance by the public in the spring and moving into the summer, departments have been and will continue to increase staffing levels at the office starting in April. Service to the public remains our top priority and our department heads or our leaders throughout the organization will continue to deliver to our residents. That said, we know that some employees may experience challenge with change, especially returning to the office full time or uh, something like that to support staff 
we've been offering ongoing mental health support and training. Going forward, employees will have access to our employee assistance program and where appropriate, um, access to remote work arrangements. So we're sort of continuing on with our hybrid approach. So that's based on the notion of the labor market, lack of affordable housing in the township and other challenges with talent management. We're proposing to continue with that hybrid work arrangement. And I believe that it will be critical going forward as part of our staff retention strategy. So as we move forward, uh, we'll report back to uh, committee and council on our progress with respect to uh, the hybrid work arrangements, probably uh, early in the fall. Um, notably, health, notable health measures that will still be in place at the office will staff can continue to mask if they feel they, they, they want to or should. There will be passive screening requirements for all staff and visitors and our requirements for enhanced cleaning will continue. The one uh, last thing I wanted to mention, Mr. Chair, is that um, you may be aware that public health has now indicated that testing for unvaccinated employees is no longer necessary. Um, so as a result of that, um, that practice will cease effective uh, 11.59 tonight. Um, the policy uh, with respect to vaccination should remain in place for now. That way, if we need to re-implement a testing program at some point based on advice from the health unit, we will be able to do that. Um, that concludes my update, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, committee, uh, any thoughts, observations? I do not have a, uh, a motion on this. This is a report, an update report from our CAO as it relates to how this corporation is handling COVID today and uh, certainly a window into the future. Councillor Kelly, go ahead. Uh, thank you and through you. And uh, just uh, wanna preface it by saying I, I had a discussion with the CAO either earlier this week or the end of last week and this subject did come up. So um, uh, he's heard it from me before, but uh, I certainly applaud uh, all of the work that staff did to stay safe and, and to work within the COVID restrictions. And the only uh, comment I would have, and, and uh, Derek confirmed this, or actually he mentioned it on the phone, when we park some of these uh, precautions, we can't park them so far away that we can't immediately retrieve them if we need them. Um, so in other words, if we're going to, you know, if, if the CAO is going to, uh, has the authority to put aside testing of unvaccinated employees, my sense is we're going to be glad that we can pull that back off the shelf and put it into place fairly quickly in about six months based on everything I'm reading. So, uh, but good job uh, to keep everybody healthy and, uh, and to get the work done. Thank you. Well, thanks for that crystal ball. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a good comment. And certainly uh, any others, any other perspectives? Okay. Seeing none. Um, thank you for that, CEO. Moving, moving along to uh, item seven, which is um, community services. Uh, we have minutes uh, accepting into the public record of the Parks and Trails Advisory Committee held on October 28th, uh, 2021. I see the chair is here for those minutes. Uh, chair Nishikawa, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, through you to the rest of council, I wanted to bring... Um, up the discussion about the the dog park uh, that was mentioned in the, in these comments. Uh, we will be actually dealing with this later today um, at the council meeting. It was noted that, for instance, one acre of land was being used as the, the amount of land available. Um, what actually came out was less than a quarter of an acre. So we were going to be we we're going to be bringing forward a, a different um, alternative um, because there certainly was not one acre uh, has noted. The other issue I wanted to also raise was um, I have concerns and um, you know I, I've been I've been involved with Hardy Lake for 25 years. It was a, a an initiative brought forward by the township uh, by volunteers in fact, as well as the Torrance Barrens and, and many of, of our other parks, quite honestly. And um, I, 
I, I disagree with that we spend annually $25,000 in Hardy Lake Park. Um, we have very successfully built the trails in that park through a volunteer network. And I would hope that um, whether it's the direction of, of um, council or, or, or our committee to council, that we actually start um, engaging with volunteers again. Um, there's a lot of value to, to work with volunteers in our township. And we've, in many ways, we've eliminated that, not just because of COVID. Um, and, but that has been Muskoka Lakes. It, it truly has been how Muskoka Lakes has been developed. Uh, so let's bring our volunteers back and get them engaged. Uh, but I will tell you that you're pretty hard pressed to spend $25,000 in Hardy Lake Park every year. Uh, we have a porta potty and a parking lot that gets plowed. Um, and we have had trails, not excuse me, I would say we have had bridges upgraded over the years. But I'm very, very concerned about the direction that, that we were going through the last meeting that we had that we're, we're pushing back to the province because we're spending a lot of money there. If you look at, even if you were to say that there was $25,000 spent in that park, that bring on average 200 people a day mm -hmm. all winter long to that park. Where else, what other establishment do we have in our township that actually brings that kind of uh, vis visitor involvement? But mostly I really would encourage council to start thinking about the importance of volunteers in our community. We talked about it a little bit this morning about the, uh, the cleanup, for instance, we do rely on those volunteer groups to do that. So I, as I said, I think we need to find a way to start engaging our volunteers more and appreciating them as well. I would say even going as further as our volunteer appreciation days that we did on a regular basis um, prior to this council. Thank you. Good, thank you. And I wonder, um, again, item 7A. So this is the minutes of the responding specifically to the October 28th minutes of 2021. Um, I guess my thought being on economic development as a committee member, um, is this an initiative in terms of the volunteers, Council Nishikawa, that um, could be brought forward through the Parks and Trails Advisory Committee? That uh, is, is, is that something that you're thinking about doing? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. And certainly- I'm not, I'm not sure, sorry, Chair Zabbat, I don't know. Um, it's not an annuity initiative. It has been the way that we've operated up until this term of council. And so I'm not quite sure what, what you would want to be brought forward. Um, rebirth, if you will, your, your recommitment, a, 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 re, a reset. It seems to me that if there's a, a lack of volunteers, but they have been here in the past and we would need to, uh, you know, reset that, then, then it, that would it, be it a great it isn't, it isn't a lack of volunteers. It's not a lack of volunteers. I know, for instance, that we, um, well, you have seen yourself, how many people show up to clean up the Torrance Barrens. Sure. Uh, there's no lack of volunteers out there. And, and I, I've, I've spoken with, um, I think there was four people present at this particular discussion that all had applied to, for instance, um, be part of a group that was going to do something through the Bala Community Center that was going to benefit the whole community. That didn't get moved forward because that was not, um, again, um, I'll leave it at that. I, I think I'm getting the message across to council that we should be trying to engage with people again. Um, our hall boards are fantastic rabbit, our resource uh, of getting things happening. And I, I do believe that we should find, if it needs another policy, let's do it. But I will say that other municipalities are doing it. I don't know why we're not any longer. Okay, good. Excellent. That, that, essentially, that's where I was going with it as well. I know the, the uh, CAO would like to have a comment if I could, or he could. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I believe I heard uh, Councillor uh, Nishikawa speak to the notion of a volunteer policy, and certainly that is that is something that the municipality at this present time does not have. Um, if that's something of interest to committee staff, would be pleased to uh, uh, bring something forward for your consideration. 
Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mazan, go ahead. And Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, and for you. Um, I think that voluntary is an important piece and I would like to, um, to support Councillor Nishikawa's request. If, if staff could come back at a future point with a policy, I think that would be um, a really helpful next step. Thank you. Good, thank you. The CAO is writing feverishly. Okay, Councillor uh, Councillor Roberts, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and through you, I'd remind staff that we did come that staff uh, did take away that idea on volunteer policies at a previous meeting in um, 2020 or twenty twenty one. Um, that we had that we had actually voted on it. I have to go back and all my notes and stuff like that. But uh, we had asked to uh, for that, so um, I can talk to uh, Director Hammond after this if he wishes. Okay. Good. Okay. So again, we take those minutes under advisement for the public record. Thank you for that, uh, Councilor Nishikawa. Oh, Councilor Hayes, go ahead. Um, thank you. I was just going to support uh, volunteerism. I think it's the backbone of a lot of the development that has happened in Muskoka Lakes, and I'd like to see it continue because it 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 makes the partnership between the township and the taxpayers uh, come alive. Excellent. Thank you. I, I do know it's been noted, uh, and thank you for that. I, I anticipate, like you, uh, further discussion on that. In, uh, in the coming months. Uh, so item 8B is a report from uh, our, our Corey Moore, Communications and Economic Development Specialist, regarding our external grant policy. Item 8B, uh, Corey, you've got the floor, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee will recall last month, we uh, had a report come forward to council seeking um, approval to sign some funding agreements um, from some grants we had received. Um, and as such, uh, staff were directed to return uh, with a simplified uh, policy to help streamline that process. Uh, so the report today highlights that draft policy, um, which helps uh, set some conditions and limitations on delegating authority for applying for grants and uh, delegating the authority for the mayor and clerk to sign such funding agreements if we're successful and the projects have been budgeted for in the budget. So just to help uh, streamline some current processes. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, continuous improvement, certainly. Uh, if there's any uh, comments uh, from anyone, I see I see no hands. I'll read uh, this, this resolution here, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa be it resolved that the external grant policy as outlined in the staff report CED 2022-13 be approved. All those in, quite in favor, sorry. It's carried. It's carried, thank you. Okay, item 8C, minutes of the Grants and Economic Development Advisory Committee uh, of January 26, 2022. We'll take those into the public record. Chair Kelly, if there's any commentary, you're certainly welcome. No, you're good? Okay, thank you for that. Item nine, unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business? Uh, seeing none. Okay, item 10, new business. And we'll work through A, B, and C. Item A is the District Municipality of Muskoka updates. Uh, Mayor Hardy, would you like to go first? We didn't have a meeting, all good. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. I, I just want to say that people should really watch the med meetings, <laughs> the district meetings, but essentially we're mostly dealing with um, the new long-term care home being built in Huntsville. Thank you. Good, thank you. Hey, I must say, as a as a um, as a public member, I was surprised to note that Gravenhurst is getting a a, a home. A big announcement, governmental, uh, and it surprised me that I didn't know. I had no I, no idea. All I've heard is Fairburn. So, I just for what that's worth in terms of optics. Um, 
I mean, it's great for Gravenhurst, but I mean, I just, I know what I hear in the news, right? Is there, can you comment on that? I don't believe it's a long-term care home. They, they have funding for a, a bunch of residential, which is a, a, under the um, yeah. community well, services. As a seniors, uh, as a seniors uh, complex. Yes, seniors, uh, seniors apartments, much like the, the Legion property in right. Bala. It's, it's, which I would say, I think is coming up to district council as well, discussion. Uh, no, this is just for housing. This is not a long-term care home. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, Councillor uh, Roberts. Thank you, Chair. And back to um, uh, Mayor Harding and the Public Works. Uh, Mayor Harding, you had said that um, that in April um, we're going to go to um, one bag um, garbage pickup. Can you elaborate on that? Or is there any other announcements on our garbage that, that will be coming forth in 2022? Are we going to clear plastic bags? Thank you. Uh, sorry, I guess I'd comment on this uh, earlier in the winter time. Uh, we're not going to one bag, we're going to two bags. We are reducing the bag limit by one bag. Uh, uh, we, the, we are increasing some organics more in the urban centers. Uh, versus the rural and looking at some pilots in the rural to try and uh, again increase diversion efforts. Uh, clear bags is a still a contemplation but not implemented yet for 2022 maybe for 2023. It's really kind of a moving target and trying to figure out how we can reduce the uh, uh, speed of which our landfill is. Good okay thank you. Okay uh, Councillor Jaglowitz if you'd be so kind. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, actually, uh, our committee did meet uh, this month. It's Finance and Corporate Services. We met on February 23rd. And um, one of the things that our committee looks at are, as you recall, there's, a, there's the impact assessment, but there's a thing called tax ratios. And that's where the district gets to assign different weighting to those assessments for tax purposes. And they come up every year. And just as an example, residential is weighted as one, and commercial is rated as 1.1. So therefore the commercial pays 10% more than, than the residential. Uh, what I had brought up a couple of meetings ago is that possibly there should be some consideration to a reduced rate for small business because that's now provided for uh, by Ontario. So staff looked at that and came back with a report and said, no, they, they felt that was not, they didn't want to implement that because it was too difficult to define a small business. So, um, so after that, I raised the issue of, because uh, we all know when the new impact assessment comes in a few years from now, there may be a very large impact on waterfront and island properties. So I asked whether the city would look at possibly giving a different tax ratio to that group. Uh, I don't know how well that was received, but at least they listened uh, uh, to it. Um, the next item was uh, we did uh, approve a tender RFP for, for insurance business, which is again, very large there same as us, a million dollars or so. And just an interesting note, annually, the auditors have always come to set, you know, sort of indicate what their program's gonna be so we can talk to them. This year, they just filed a report. So that shortened our meeting somewhat. That's my report, thank you. Good, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you very much, I'll try and be brief. Uh, our meeting was held. Uh, the Skoka Tourism and Marketing Agency uh, gave us an update and they were telling us how many hits they're getting and everything else like that. And they're looking at, at maybe closing uh, the Tourist Information Center on uh, Highway 11, but be, because of COVID, of course, it, not too many people are stopping there and that, but uh, uh, it looks like they're getting a lot of hits. Now, how many dollars were spent from those hits, we don't know. Uh, children and senior services, um, the uh, childhood and early uh, years workforce development funding. Uh, the province gave, the Minister of Education gave us $388,415 towards uh, the development of a strategy for early years and child care sectors, which we gladly accepted. There was an update on the new leaf on uh, the Muskoka climate change, out of 112 actions, 
we've we've taken uh, action on uh, 51 so far working on that. That was from uh, Kevin Boyle and uh, Christine Doyle. Uh, the integrate water management, uh, what it is is they're changing the uh, board and that uh, and there'll be two members from from the district on that and two member uh, and then two other members on the watershed council. okay so there'll be two on the board. It was recommended uh, for one but uh, the district felt that there should be two on the board. And I believe it'll be uh, Councillor uh, Papard and Councillor Alcott will be on, on the board. I will be on the Watershed Council as well as Paul Bianca. And uh, let's see now. There are some official plan amendments. Um, It was a uh, subdivision for the township of uh, Muskoka Lakes. Now it, uh, it's, it's called um, Muskoka Trails and it's in, in uh, Port Carling by the, the, the uh, water tower it goes from there over to Foreman Road. Uh, I think the entrance is right beside fixtures and that. And uh, there's gonna be about 218 units there. I believe there's 95 single and then the rest will be and that uh, multi, we did not get the plan, but they will be uh, trying to have a, a meeting sometime in April on that. Um, there was a, a meeting for Gravenhurst, and uh, that is my report. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, so that uh, wraps up item 10A. Item 10B, community events update. I'll look for uh, hands going up of items that are things that are happening around the township over the next uh, short while. I think Councillor Nishikawa is going to put her hand up. Go ahead, Ruth. We are celebrating St. Patrick's Day in Bala. Um, the, um, on Thursday and Friday this week, there will be, um, and it's all safe in there, but I'm just saying, but um, basically all of the procedures are in place. Uh, there will be music both on Thursday and Friday and, of course, our Irish Fair. Um, also, I'm very excited. Um, my son was very disappointed when he was home at Christmas that he couldn't go to the Port Carling Legion for breakfast. Um, but this week is their first breakfast, and I am I will be supporting it. I, I do believe that um, everything is in place that will keep everyone safe. Um as much as they do in the grocery store. So I, I'm just suggesting that those two events are, are worth supporting. Thank you. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, and Councillor Nishikawa, uh, is it the 24th of uh, March for Euchre at uh, the Torrance Community Center? That will be the soft opening. We're not advertising that at the moment. We are mostly trying to um, put again, have you seen the list of procedures that have to go along with this? I'm just saying, but we, we, we want to address, um, some of the seniors in the community, uh, that mostly have been, have felt, um, not connected. Uh, so it, again, it's a soft opening and then we'll have additional signage going up in a later date. Thanks. Okay, well, I know my mother wasn't listening, so she didn't hear me. <laughs> uh, Councillor Roberts, go ahead. Thank you. It just reminded me um, that uh, in Milford Bay Community Center, they kicked off cards for the first time in two years on Monday night, and that's going to be an ongoing thing every Monday night. Plus, there's some interest to get um, cards during the, the, the weekdays, and pickleball is already in full swing at the Milf Milford Bay Community Center. Thank you. Good, thank you. Councillor Hayes. Okay, through you at the Walkers Point Community Center. On Mondays, we have a uh, walking club, which does the Arthritis Society workout. On Wednesdays, uh, we have yoga from 10 until 1130. Um, and I understand on uh, April 7th, our indoor pickleball for the Walkers Point people will be starting up. And I've uh, also received um, an invitation for a 
potluck dinner at the end of March at the Walker's Point Community Center. So it looks like things are starting to open up. Good stuff. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item 10C. Uh, item 10C is a discussion. Uh, Mayor Harding uh, has put this on the agenda regarding council compensation review. Sir, I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And just for uh, council to chime in as to where we want to go. Um, typically, as uh, councillors will know, uh, this term of council would vote as to next term of councillors, any salary increases, adjustments, changes, so that we're theoretically not voting our own uh, raises, if you will. Um, the issue is we did a review about, and the clerk can correct me, about two and a half years ago. Uh, we chose uh, to implement a couple of those things, but not fully implement all of that review. But one of the things we did change was our policy that we would be conducting a review within 18 months of the end of the term of council to affect next council and then have a citizens advisory committee uh, chime in just to make sure what we're recommending is appropriate. The issue is we did not do that specifically, or we didn't have uh, 18 months ago presented to our council a review to be able to chime in for the next term of council. So um, I think we either need to amend the policy or uh, we will, at the end of the day, leave any salaries and compensation status quo and that it would be implemented for the council at 2028 or 2027, I guess, would be the next potential raise if we let the uh, future council uh, decide on the next term of council. So um, understanding that uh, you might be eight years out from any price financial adjustments that come forward. So uh, the question is, do we want to investigate some kind of a review, uh, which would theoretically go against our procedural bylaw, the clerk can again correct me, um, but allow some potential changes for the next term of council. And I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Okay, good. We thank you for that. And we have uh, we have some hands up. Councillor Kelly, then Councillor Nishikawa, go ahead. Uh, thank you. It's just a quick question uh, through you. <clears throat> Does the automatic escalation with the cost of living carry on regardless of what we do, or do we actually have to take a positive step in order for that to happen as well? I'll ask the clerk. I believe it does, and I believe um, Ms. Lehman can, can uh, fill you in with more details on that. Yeah. Yes, that, thank you. Right here. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yep, that, that does happen automatically through budget. Okay. Councillor Kelly, is that you good? Uh, I mean, I'm good unless I, I, I can take a stab at the other or the half of the question, if you will. Um, <clears throat> I think we, we should do not, I, I don't think we should do nothing. I think we need to do something positive, whether we look at it and decide that no action will be taken. I think it would be somewhat negligent on our behalf to hand this over for four years to a subsequent council to, uh, you know, assume with nothing in the background, no, no recommendation. Um, the difficulty that I have quite honestly is that there's, you know, let me just bear my soul. We're not going to get into this discussion of what the right price is. But I can tell you that we all knew what we were going to get paid when we signed on for this job. Um, but we probably underestimated by a huge mile <laughs> what the scope and the nature and the, and the actual time commitment was going to look like. Uh, so if you came in here thinking it was be a couple hours a week, uh, you know, I would remind you that uh, without, you know, We've got 184 pages in the deck for today, 312 for this afternoon, 421, thanks to Chair Bridgman, for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's just a huge, huge time commitment that, quite frankly, uh, you know, it's the iceberg effect. Uh, there's far more of it beneath the surface than there is above. So I can tell you that of all of the uh, <clears throat> jobs that I've had, right from when I probably started cutting grass or doing babysitting, this one compensates you the least for the time and the effort and the commitment that you put into it. 
and I think it deserves to be looked at. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think we should be the ones looking at it. Uh, 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 Mayor Harding suggested they, or, or mentioned a, uh, a review by a group of citizens. I quite frankly think it should be almost handed off to them for a complete understanding of the nature and the scope of the job and a recommendation as to what might be a more appropriate uh, salary. But I, I don't hold out a lot of hope, uh, quite frankly, that it's going to make a material difference. You know, two uh, percent or three percent for inflation is not going to make the adjustment uh, um, meaningful. Uh, this needs to be either reconsidered in a completely different light, or we're all just going to have to go back to the comfort that we get from knowing that we're serving the public well, that we're, uh, you know, that we get the psychic income that comes from doing good for the township. Uh, and the value of the education that no doubt we all get. I've been told at least 35 times this winter how to plow a road. And, uh, you know, you don't get that education for free. <laughs> Everywhere I go, somebody's telling me stuff. So That's I think it needs to be looked at. I frankly don't think we should be looking at it. I think we should ask a, a group to look at it, uh, you know, of, of uh, constituents. Um, and I'm happy to live uh, with whatever their recommendation is. Uh, but I don't think that doing nothing is the right response to the circumstance that we're in. That's it. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Nishikawa. Um, thank you. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to ask the mayor or um, Frank, uh, but uh, the district just recently, uh, we didn't raise that under our district um, discussions, but um, just approved. Um, what they're doing for next term of council. And I would suggest that at the minimum, we look at following their uh, guidance. But I, I do believe that there, um, that committee should be struck. Um, but again, uh, just looking at district, I mean, they already did that heavy lifting. We did a little bit of it in the past. Um, but, but as I said, I, I think that, um, I think we're gonna fall in, pretty close place to what they've already approved. Okay, um, Councillor Roberts and then the mayor. Thank you, Chair. And I echo uh, what my colleagues have just uh, said, um, specifically um, on Councillor Kelly, um, <laughs> in comparing it to jobs that we did when we were teenagers, like washing dishes at Holiday Inn. But, um, I, I asked the clerks uh, uh, the other the last month to report on how many meetings we've had. And it was just, I knew it was high, but that's just the meetings is the preparation time is talking to constituents. It's following up. It is. It, and, and yes, uh, Councillor Kelly was right. We, we all went in with our eyes open on the amount of, uh, uh, of, of pay for this job, but it's, it's, it's just, it's actually disrespectful to think that people think we should be paid less because I've heard that too. So I think it, they should, and I agree with Councillor Kelly, this should be a, there should be a committee struck, maybe our, our friends from the MLA and friends of Muskoka and, and from our Muskoka and et cetera should come together and uh, propose uh, something that we should be, how we should be compensated. So the, that's my thoughts. I think it should go to a committee and it needs to be done this year and it should not be punted down four years. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Pre the mayor and then Councillor Hayes and Mazan, I'm going to let the clerk uh, provide some insight. Thank you. So I think staff are happy to take some direction and consensus on uh, potentially a path forward to bring something back to this committee. One thing I will note uh, is that the time has sort of passed to have an ad hoc committee struck and be certain that there is going to be a report that's going to come back to this committee before the lame duck period might already be declared. So the policy as it's currently written uh, requires this sort of uh, process to happen at least 18 months before an election cycle. And we're well past that, obviously. Um, there is a lot of work and training that needs to go into setting up that committee. And then it's in their hands and we can't give them 
uh, or it'd be difficult to sort of say to them, you have a very short amount of time to come to a conclusion on this. Um, so under the current policy, it would be difficult to strike the ad hoc committee as it's written in that policy. Inverse to that, thank you for the comment, but inverse to that, we, this, this committee, this council could consider its own rate, giving itself a raise. So just so everyone understands, um, you know, that is within our purview. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing either way, I'm not suggesting we do either go either way, but that is some, something that we could do and we could do it, um, you know, over the next uh, 60 days. Uh, I'm not sure about how that gets us to a lame duck scenario and the optics of that. So let's have this discussion. Mayor Harding, go ahead. Thank you. Just as a path forward, and again, I think uh, the clerk has outlined that our procedural bylaw says 18 months ahead of the election. We certainly can't meet that, so we'd have to make an amendment or an exception to the procedural bylaw that this council can vote on or this committee can vote on ultimately at council. My, my recommendation, I appreciate outsiders. Uh, district did a district review based on upper tier governments and compensation from there. Uh, I do believe our manager uh, of HR, Ms. Lehman, can certainly help and guide us could do an internal report, provide it to council, um, at which point we could have an understanding of where we should or shouldn't be. At that point, I think we could decide, do we immediately approve it or do we actually solicit some outside input? We do know that our uh, Muskoka ratepayers, that uh, the MLA, Friends of Muskoka, uh, our Muskoka, all the appropriate ratepayer groups certainly love to comment regularly. Maybe we can just solicit their comment before we potentially make any recommendations. But I think it's going to start with some internal reports. Um, and a starting point would be some internal reports to give us a baseline uh, as to where we may or may not go going forward. And uh, I'd look to the clerk to see if that could be done within the next 60 days, per se, to come back to council, let's say in May, with an idea. And then we can determine where we would want to go from that point or solicit additional input um, going forward. Let's just ask our clerk how viable that is. Just to clarify, uh, the 18 month uh, time frame is actually in the council compensation policy, not in the procedural bylaw. Um, so we could take away if it is the will of committee today to look at how that policy or outside of that policy doing an internal review uh, we'd have to review how long that might take to look at comparators and bring that back to committee who can then make a recommendation, this committee who can then make a recommendation to council. Uh, and there is that, that potential. Um, that had, obviously I, I was not here, but my understanding is there had been some of that hap happened during this term of council and it was determined that that um, that mechanism wasn't really desirable. And so this ad hoc committee would be a better way of doing this. So uh, unfortunately that ad hoc committee uh, wasn't struck because in this term of council, there was already at least one review done as per that policy. Um, so looking for some direction, I think about whether or not we'd like to undertake an internal um, sort of review and have that come back to general finance or um, brainstorm some other ideas and have that come back to this committee. Okay, thank you. And with that, I'll continue on with all the hands that are up. Councillor Hayes. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, I know that uh, Sarah has provided us with information in the past on um, where we stand uh, with different areas. However, if we could get a more in-depth view of that and include the workload, so the number of hours that their council meetings are, the number of hours on average that um, their um, committee of the whole meetings are. And then look at the workload because and I understand that some of the areas have two hour planning meetings, something I have not seen in a number of years. Um, whereas we're sitting here with eight hours and pushing it over into another day. So if, if the workload could be looked at 
as well as the remuneration. I think that would give a better idea of um, what we what is needed to um, give counselors a good remuneration for the work that's done. Okay, thank you, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, so Councillor Hayes just brought up uh, something I had been thinking about. It, it really does warrant an actual understanding of what is, is a part of our job and are we um, in an appropriate bracket. I, I recall seeing the previous um, charts and it was comparing us to the other jurisdictions here in the municipalities here in Muskoka but I do think our workload needs to be understood and then understand if the compensation is appropriate for that. So uh, I think it's a, it's more than just giving us another five or 6% increase or whatever the number may be, but actual a full understanding of the role. And um, so my second question or comment was about a path board. And I guess this is a question for the clerk. Um, is there a way to set up this committee that then bridges into the next term of council. So this committee could be doing the work that could come back to the future council. So that our job in this would be to start the process, but then the future council would be the one that would be tasked with understanding it. And is that even a possibility? Clerk? So um, whether it's a possibility, we could look at it and come back to this committee with recommendation on that, but uh, just off the top of my head, it would sort of defeat the purpose of that ad hoc committee because that ad hoc committee is used to clearly keep council at an arm's length from those recommendations for the next council uh, yes. to actually have those increases should they be approved. So um, that is a consideration to make. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think one of the councillors mentioned the district's policy and I have it in front of me and he might, I'm, I'm not gonna get into the details with just the procedure that's followed there. Uh, uh, in the year prior to, or just before an election, uh, a report comes from the Director of Human Resources to, to the Finance and Corporate Service Committee, which is this committee, the equivalent of this sure. committee. And how they handled the arm's length situation rather than an ad hoc committee, they hired a consultant as they do every year. And in that report, and I would reference it to you, if you go to the finance and uh, corporate services uh, of um, January 19th, 2022, it's a report FCS 1-2022-1. And it's not appropriate because they're comparing it to district uh, municipalities, but in there on table four, they've listed out the comparison for the six area municipalities in our area. I can tell you the biggest problem with this whole thing was that the consultants picked the comparative group and that's what Councillor Mazden was referring to. And, and, that, be, and, and that, that becomes the issue. So if, if a comparative group can be selected municipalities to compare to, it was very easy to staff to put those numbers together. You just call up and get, and get the numbers. But, but what was also included in that report was then four options of how to deal with it. And so the, the finance committee dealt with it. They sent it back for more information. They then approved it. And then it went forward to council and the minority of council objected to it because it was increasing it quite substantially over four years. And that was voted down by a vote of say, say three to, um, three to two, like two thirds, one third type thing. So I, an ad hoc committee is really a tough thing, but you know, that procedure could, uh, could, could be followed. Uh, as I say, I think that the only thing that consultants really did is they picked the, uh, the comparative uh, municipalities. But anyway, there's a lot of background information in there um, now, by the way, I'm not, I'm not advocating for a large increase, but I, I have to agree with the other councillors that say it's really our job to take a look at this, not the new council. So I, I would agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillor uh, Edwards and then the mayor and then Councillor Kelly, and then we'll wrap this up.
Uh, thank you, Chair Zavitz. Uh, Councillor uh, and that Jag, which can, can, can probably uh, confirm this, but I think what it is, is the district at the lower of everything, the, 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 the lowest uh, amount, which was about $1,500 a year. And that will go up uh, $1,500 each year. That at the end will only bring us to the 45th percentile of all the other municipalities and that. So, uh, you know, if you're looking at that, it's $1,500 a year. So if uh, that would give us something in that. Now, uh, as far as the uh, ad, um, lame duck and that, I think there, uh, and that the uh, clerk can, can correct me on this, but there's two uh, uh, lame duck thing. One is uh, in around uh, nomination day in May, is it not? And then the other was uh, at the election. So we're getting very, very tight for this. And if we're going to get something for the next council, we should be doing it right away. And that um, I think uh, our HR uh, specialist can, can bring something up. But uh, looking at that, even if it's uh, $100 a month, and that each year it's something because we have not been doing this. Every council says, oh, well, we can't do this. We can't do that. And we're so far behind now. And that uh, you're, you're talking about uh, things. I, I know myself, I've been tracking it and I spent over 30 hours a, a, a week on this. So uh, just so that you, you know, by the time you do all the reading of, of all the pages and everything else like that, and uh, you're talking on the phone, you're answering emails and everything and that. I don't think we should uh, be ashamed to ask for some sort of a raise and that for the next council, because a lot of us may not be on it, but I think it, it's only fair for the next council and that and, and holding it over for the next council to give themselves a raise, I think is wrong. I think we should have, have done it sooner, but I think we should uh, push this through and, and have it uh, and that confirmed by me and that. Thank you. Okay. We'll let our clerk have a comment and then we, before we move on. Just to clarify, the lame duck, talking about integrating technology. Okay, so uh, just to clarify, the potential lame duck periods would be from nomination to election day. So that's August 19th to October 24th, 2022 and uh, election day to the end of term. So that's October 24th, 2022 to November 15th, 2022. Um, there have been some compensation reviews in this term of council. I can review those if anyone's interested in them. Um, but I guess the question and you know what staff are looking for a direction on is would it be the desire to sort of bring an internal report back to this committee and sort of put aside the compensation review policy um, or how, how would committee like to proceed? Thank you for that. Mayor Harding, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And as the starting point, let's see if I can hopefully land this airplane with council or committee in this particular case. I think uh, personally, I think uh, our manager of HR has the ability internally to do a compensation review. We talk about comparator groups. We have five others within the district of Muskoka, which would be our closest comparator groups. Um, if she can add some time and effort uh, and uh, hourly commitment that we already have some data, uh, that might be another component that she could add into it, but I'd leave it at her discretion. Um, she can respond back to this, uh, I'll say committee council, and I'll come back to that in a second. And at which point we can determine whether or not we want to solicit additional input or not, or we want to just say, this is appropriate, let's move forward. But I think from a start today perspective that we would, I would like to direct uh, staff to start that internal review and a compensation review, which would be going against our compensation policy, agreed. But I think we have the ability to do that. From a timing perspective, as we do sit in committee of the whole or planning or general finance, uh, to actually make final decisions on this, my recommendation is this comes uh, as a report directly to council that we can make some comments going forward that way. Um, the 30 day time frame and the past and the past may get us into a lame duck issue, and I'd prefer to try and keep this moving. I think that would be a path forward if uh, the rest of the committee would recommend the same or support that, uh, and we can make our next decision once uh, Ms. Lehman has some information to us. Thank you. 
Good. So the uh, the I idea that we would expedite directly to council next month is is a sound one. Thank you for that, Councillor Kelly. Go ahead, and then Councillor Jagwitz. Oh, we're frozen. Just uh, two comments. Thank you uh, through you. Uh, one, interestingly enough, Councillor Edwards suggested that 30 hours a week was basically a time commitment. I did some quick uh, numbers at 34 hours a week based on municipal salary alone, you're making 15 bucks an hour. Um, so uh, just to give you some sense. Uh, the other comment I have, and quite honestly, I, I think if all we're going to do is hold ourselves up against comp uh, you know, uh, comparative groups, uh, we're, we're wasting our time and we're wasting the time of whoever we ask to look at it. Uh, it, it really isn't a matter of whether within a thousand or two thousand or an adjustment of a couple of thousand dollars. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that quite frankly, I think there's a whole valuation, uh, uh, there's an upside down valuation on the time and energy that it takes to do this job well. And I think the biggest obstacle and the biggest reason it needs to be looked at through the, that filter, not, not how much I could make if I ran in Seguin, uh, how much is the energy and the, and the effort and the uh, experience that we each bring to this table worth to the constituents the reason that's important is if we're going to continue to uh, attract good candidates to step up and run for this job, it's going to have to be uh, uh, appropriately compensated or they're going to leave frustrated as quickly as they can get out. Um, so, but I, I think I wouldn't advise and I would not support, uh, you know, hiring a consultant or working with anybody who's simply going to say, well, Gravenhurst makes this and uh, Huntsville makes that. That, that, that that's not going to make a meaningful impact and it says nothing about the value of what's being done here. What would you suggest? I, I, I think it well what I would suggest if that's the best we're going to be able to do we, we should just take the whatever cost of living allowance is year over year and make that available to the next term and carry on because I can't see any meaningful help coming comparable to the other uh, jurisdictions in our in our town in our uh, district um, in, all, in all honesty I, I just think that's the case okay. I, I what, sorry different. what I'm I guess what I'm looking at is if you had to value this position if there, if there was no such thing as the township of Muskoka Lakes and you were creating it from new from scratch and you were trying to recruit people to do this job you wouldn't value it according to what I do the same job somewhere else. It, it, this has its own, you know, uh, time commitments, its own uh, uh, complications, its own complexities. And, and how would that get valued? What, what would this time and energy be worth per hour? And how many hours does it take to do the job? That's how I'd look at it. Not, not by holding it up against other, other uh, jurisdictions. Okay. So, uh, okay. Thank you for that. And Councillor Jagowitz and then the mayor again. Yes, yes, Chair, very briefly, I'm just gonna talk about procedure now. Um, uh, I, I, I have a problem if we don't follow our own policy. So if we're going to not follow it, I would suggest staff should come back with an amended policy at the same time. So whatever, so that we amend it for the future and not just ignore the policy we passed. So, so my suggestion would be if we're gonna deal with it now um, and not have an ad hoc committee, that whatever policy we set come back and we uh, uh, change it at the same time so that it's not just uh, uh, just this group trying to not follow its own policies. Thank Good. you. And that, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, Mayor Harding and then uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly's comments. Um, there's no question the role of a counselor um, needs to be fully understood. Um, but I, I, I would be hard pressed to tell our constituents when we're making $25,000 a year or $30,000 a year that it's actually $100,000 a year job. Um, and that's what it might actually be. But for us to try and do that, especially without an ad hoc committee uh, and fully digesting that in the next three months or six months is an impossible task. Um, what I think we do need to do is truly understand, again, our comparators, and I will say that again, it's not a waste of time, um, to understand where we are to try and level the playing field of those in and around us and what a 
counselor traditionally makes, you know, does the CFO of OPG, does he deserve a half a million dollar salary or a million dollar salary plus bonuses, plus, 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 uh, you know, there's, there's lots of jobs that don't always fairly or duly compensate. So I think as a starting point, what every municipality typically does is an internal uh, review of some variety. The idea of us comment, uh, commenting on that to get us to a starting point for next term of council, I believe is 100% appropriate. And I would like to do that more than a 2.3% CPI index. Um, and then the second thing, if we want to next term of council, do a bigger, deeper dive on what a councillor in Ontario or in the Township Muskoka Lake should fully be paid. That's something that we could do over the next term of council to look at for the future term of council going forward. But to try and do a quick deep dive today to adjust for next term, I think uh, is uh, not appropriate for us to do. So I'm very happy for uh, Ms. Lehman to do an initial and at which point we can decide, we can throw it out or we can not throw it out, but we need to have that data to make a decision and termination. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Edwards and then Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Zab. I'll be quick. Uh, I, I think in that, Ms. Lehman can, can uh, do an evaluation uh, in that. And if you're going to talk about spending money on a uh, somebody to, to, to look into this, why don't we just take that, that amount and split it 10 ways? Because we'd probably be further ahead than, than we are now with what, what consultants are charging nowadays. Every time I, I, I look at the at something at, at the district, it's 50,000 or 75,000 for, for this and that and that. And they just tell you what you want to hear anyway. So I think it's a waste of, of money at this time. And I think even something minor for now that the next council gets something for it rather than just the uh, 2%. Thank you. Okay, good. So uh, Councillor Kelly, then Bridgman, then Mazan. Oh. Thank you through you. I think I'm gonna agree with both the mayor and uh, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Edwards. Um, that's why I suggested from the start that we not have anything to do with this. It get turned over to a third party outside. Now I understand there are logistical reasons and legal reasons why that's not practical or possible. I, you know, I, I, uh, I suppose if we're going to do a, com a comparative, we have to be prepared for the possibility that we're in the top uh, 20% and, uh, and, and uh, that that would mean, I don't know what that would mean. I guess we're, we're not going to work for less, but we're certainly not going to see an increase if, if the uh, comps come out against us. I, I, I just don't think this is something solved. The issue I have isn't something that's going to be solved by reassuring me that I'm in the same you know, quadrant as a counselor in some other jurisdiction. This is a, a fresh look at a, at a job that's probably evolved and become much more, uh, much more of a heavy lift than it ever was before. That's all. Right. Okay, Councillor Bridgman. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Zavitz, because I haven't spoken before. I fully support um, uh, Ms. Lehman having a look at this, but I really think we need on top of just the Compensation, I support the number of hours and the number of hours of meetings and the number of meetings because I think that plays into where you end up in your comparisons with 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 others. So I would like to see those two stats. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, and through you, um, just a question from Ms. Lehman. I probably should know this, but uh, is there a job description for a councillor? And I, I, as I've been listening to yeah. all of this, I remember a lot of this is for future counselors. I remember having conversations with people who are current counselors or previous counselors. And my understanding coming in to what was very different than what the reality has been, even pre-COVID, right? Where there was a couple of meetings a month, a little bit of reading here and there. And um, I think we've all probably experienced that. So part of that, I think it would be very helpful to understand. Here's the type job of description. a job description, including this is what you can reasonably expect from a time commitment. And the reason I'm saying this, I've had people um, interested in understanding whether they should run. And, you know, I haven't had the 30 hours kind of rolling off my tongue like Councillor Edwards did, but I, I have been somewhat honest to say, you know, my other full-time job is raising a family. But if you have another job and you're doing this job, how effective can you be? 
and um, as a counselor. And I think that's a, it's a really important consideration. So I just put that out there. Um, I don't know if we have one. If we do, I'd love to see it. And then I could probably layer in the reality of some of these things that you're hearing from the rest of us today. Thanks. I love it. That's excellent. Okay. Um, our CAO is going to try to land this thing um, in terms of his observation, but certainly um, I, I guess that what we're up against here is a, is a timing issue, notwithstanding um, the constraints of uh, what the compensation should be versus what it is. So a very weighty topic. And um, I'm going to let uh, the CAO have a few comments here before we land it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very interesting discussion. And I, I'm going to preface my comments by uh, allowing the clerk to correct me if I'm wrong or wants to add any any clarity or uh, uh, additional comments. Um, but it strikes me that uh, from what I've heard that you're interested in uh, Ms. Lehman performing some kind of review uh, ASAP as it pertains to uh, an adjustment that would apply to the early on the next term of council. The other matters that you've raised, uh, I'm gonna to suggest to you and, and what I'm hearing you say is that the job of a counselor, it's evident that it's becoming more complex as time goes by. And I'm, I'm sure that some of our um, longer serving members would agree that some of the issues that we're being faced with now are much more complex than perhaps when they started their careers. And I'm, I'm getting some confirmation from Councillor Edwards. So thank you for that. That said, uh, it, it strikes me that the level of detail that you want to go to with respect to, you know, comparing the amount of time that you spend reading materials, et cetera, versus that in other communities, counselors in other communities, uh, it may be comparable, it may not. It depends on the, the issues that they're facing. Um, and, and, and their committee structures, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of variables there that would need to be looked at. And so to be fair, that's gonna take staff a, a fair amount of time to, to wade through, if you will. And so I would suggest to you that those types of, um, that, that level of analysis should be done during the sort of next review in the next term. So, I guess in summary, what I'm saying is we're happy to come back to you with comparators. Uh, the next meeting, you can look at that, make a decision thereon, and then then sort of the notion of a more thoughtful analysis in the uh, the, the, the next term would be my suggestion. Thank you. Okay, seeing no more hands, and and obviously a great discussion. Um, the, the way you sort of ended that was different than the way you started it, <laughs> uh, CAO, which, which was in terms of uh, that, you know, that larger and more fulsome um, uh, look at this thing. I don't wanna say we're out of time, but we are up against a time constraint. And I personally don't like the optic of uh, voting ourselves a raise in the next 60 days, uh, right before an election, the election signs start to pop up. So uh, I, th there is that as well. At the same time, we have to be acknowledged, we have to acknowledge the uh, the incredible e energy and effort of, of what this job entails. And um, that is a heavier lift for personally, uh, I think I think it, it, the council presented said we could start it. We could, could we start it and then move it on to the next council? Sounds like that's not um, the most viable uh, opportunity. So, um, you know, I, I guess we can we can certainly ask staff. We do not need a resolution here today. We can ask staff to come back with um, a list of uh, parameters and, and comparators given what they've heard today. Um, do we ask them to come right? To uh, does that report go right to council? And we uh, we at that council meeting in in April, we put our big kid boots on and and have some really serious dialogue then and there about um, how we want to take that information, and uh, and we're voting. Otherwise, we're into you know April for GNF May and and here it is May second and and people can start to announce they're running etc. So I don't know how you feel, but that's how I feel, um, Mayor. Thank you. I think uh, we heard it from uh, our CIO and I've heard it around the table uh, to have uh, our manager of HR provide a report to council. And I'm going to suggest council. We can defer it. We can delay the decision. We can do whatever we need to do. But okay. she would bring us back a 
council composition or, or compensation review um, as soon as she can, and at which point we can decide how we want to deal with it at that particular point. All we're going to do today is start the process to have our staff uh, do some investigation as to where we are from a comparator perspective. And I think that's a direction to staff from this meeting. Thank you. So I'll ask two, uh, I'll ask two groups uh, a question each. So uh, Ms. Lehman and our CAO clerk, uh, is that viable to come back to council in April with uh, some semblance of the report that the mayor has uh, framed up? If not, We can, we, can, we, can, we can. So generally in the committee structure, this report would come to GNF. If it's the consensus and direction of committee, then it, we can return to council if that is the direction. Um, obviously in 30 days, the report is going to be sort of the local comparators and, and put that to council or committee. And if that's what uh, the direction is, we can, we can do that. Okay. So committee, there's the challenge. Uh, could I ask you here and now to indicate to me that you would prefer um, the uh, review to come to uh, council in April um, as we've been discussing? Is there a general thumbs up? That's how we'd like to see it go, thumbs up, that it would, uh, it would come forward to council next month for consideration. As the mayor said, we don't necessarily, you know, we, we could defer it at that time, but it gets it gets information to oh, us yeah. and it starts this process. And right now, you know, we essentially are nowhere and we need to start. I, personally, I think we need to start. So uh, I would be in support of that, but I'm not seeing, I'm seeing one, two, three. Can I see thumbs up? There's, there we go, there we go. Okay, so as I see it, we have a majority. Get the consensus up there. Oh, okay. So if you don't mind, again, a show of hands, a thumbs up uh, in support of coming back to council. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's everyone. Good. Okay. Thank you, committee. That was excellent. And uh, Sarah, <laughs> we'll see you in 30 Good days. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. And um, the only other item, which is, of course, item uh, 11. It, oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Jaguars. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, that, that's fine. I just wanted you, you didn't deal with the part I suggested at the same time you come back with a revised policy. Oh, uh, absolutely. That, pardon? I'm sorry. We'll make, uh, yeah, exactly. And I apologize for that. And certainly thank you for reminding uh, that, that we would uh, look to recommendations at that time as well as it relates to that policy so that. Um, uh, you know, it's dealt with and, and this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Item 11, uh, we have A through uh, JKL as it relates to items that have come into the, uh, the township over the last month and some others that have been hanging around a little bit. Does anyone have any particular items that they would like to pull out of this and or, uh, there we go, there's a couple of hands up. Okay, so uh, Councillor Edwards and then Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, Chair Zabich. Um, I guess item uh, 11C, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, and that item D, um, Bridges and uh, Culberts, we should be looking at. Uh, dissolving uh, the OLT, that's uh, 11G. And uh, 11H, uh, hospital uh, capital funding. I think that's something that we should be answering. Um, and also uh, 11I, the, uh, the uh, termination of the uh, membership for the Ontario Municipal Water Association. That, that was uh, really alarming reading that one. And that, I don't know if anybody else would like to uh, comment on any of those, but it's something we should maybe look at. Thank you. L, correct? The last one, item L, termination. Uh, okay, yeah, L, sorry, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, good. And we'll ask that question in just a moment. Uh, Councillor uh, Roberts, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Mine is 11C, the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. I'd like to discuss that. Okay. All right, any other uh, councillors any, having any, any comments or thoughts on what we see in front of us. 
Okay, so, okay, there's Councilman Ishikawa, go ahead. Ruth, we lost you. Hmm, okay, well, maybe she was, uh... oh, there you go. Well, because um, my computer is set up to warn me that I have a meeting in two minutes. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned, actually, the direction that this meeting has gone in. Uh, that in fact, we do have a council meeting. We're supposed to have a council meeting at one o'clock. And in fact, we had a break for our staff at 10 o'clock. It's three hours later. And I, I don't, I think that we should be looking at trying to do better, quite frankly. Um, but I don't think that we did better today. And I know it's not on this part of the, the meeting, but I really think that if some of these items that people wanted to discuss, if we could find a different way or a better way to, to move this forward, um, I would appreciate it. And, and in fact, maybe it's done by way of emails um, ahead of time, I'm not sure, but I'm very concerned about the timing and what we have done to our staff, quite frankly. And I would sure hope that HR isn't gonna get involved. Okay, good, more question. Uh, Mayor Harding, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Councilor Shikara, for that comment. Um, uh, the idea of the correspondence on the agenda was that if a councillor believes that they want to put something forward, they would speak with another councillor uh, and they could advise the clerk that they would like to bring this to the next meeting. Um, and that's sort of the process versus time and time again, us getting an email Tuesday, next Friday, they're all collected in one spot. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think we all need to comment that we like this now. Um, if, uh, you know, Councillor Edwards believes in something and he has another colleague friend around the table, they can bring it forward to the next item and putting it on the table uh, for council consideration. Um, from a process time, yes, we've been three hours. Uh, I'm also going to recommend that we start council at 2 p.m. today, unfortunately. Um, one of the things that I, we do notice and it is problematic uh, at times with our committee structure that we have 10 people around the table and we have 20 comments on every single item. Um, I, I would just, as we move forward into 2023 and beyond from an extremer council, I'm going to just as a fun suggestion, ask this committee again to consider in the back of your mind, reducing the number of councillors on our committees that we always have the ability at council to correct any mistakes that a committee member makes or that the committee recommendation um, that, you know, we can debate lots of items, but we ultimately get to the right decision, I believe. And I know we do. And again, if a committee for some reason was skewed to the wrong decision, it could be rectified at council. So um, I, I just, that's not for discussion today, but just file it in the back of your mind because I think it's a, certainly a way for us to speed up these meetings uh, that we don't need four hours to get through this topic uh, of general and finance this morning, that it could have been done uh, in short with, with fewer people around the table, we could have got to many of the same answers. So um, I leave it at that and uh, look forward to council at 2 p.m. Okay, good, thank you. And based on that, uh, we'll take the uh, under advisement, your indications from uh, both councillors Edwards and Roberts in terms of the items noted here accordingly, and we'll move those forward. Um, I would read um, the resolution here, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Uh, be a result of this meeting adjourn at 1254 p.m. And the next regular meeting of the General Finance Committee will be held on Wednesday, April 13, 2022 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair electronically from the Council Chambers Municipal Office in Port Carling, Ontario. All those in favor? Good, thank you. That's carried. We'll see you at two o'clock.